Welcome to another edition of Mass Mats and Mayhem. I am your host, Justin Harvey. You can find me on Twitter at JustinHarvey75. You can find the entire show on Twitter at MMMShow75. I am joined today in the flesh, kinda, as far as the internet goes, by the, the what are you, are hoarding zombies back there? Casey Nielsen, what are you doing? I think he's more of a goblin. I don't know. He, he, he's my pal. He's like my podcasting partner. I felt kind of lonely here by myself, so I just had a friend. Well, it's better than this just curtain thing I got back here. It's just blocking the the all of LA's sunshine. Ah, yeah. it's the sun's out there. Yeah, we still have sun. Hey, who's that guy? T.J. Miller. Thanks for joining the show. Holy shit! It's T.J. Miller. Uh, no, stop talking. I want to be on TV. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Stop. Wait. When do? I, oh, I don't see myself when I'm on, do I? I don't know. I see myself when I'm on. When do I, I think we broke we asked Jack Evans last week so you would be comfortable with how it worked already, Byron? Why are you being surprised with how it works now? I just wasn't really paying attention. Great. Great. I'm glad we used up a whole week of our episode time testing things out for you to still not know how they work. It was a good up. It was one of our best episodes. <laughs> the okay. one where I just did a 6-minute update and said, "Hey, we'll be back with some new cool shit next week." <laughs> I yeah, wanted to have right. this behind me, you guys, but I would have had to put another hole in my wall. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, it's signed, Mr. Abdul the Butcher, too. Thank you, Casey, for getting us that explicit tag again. I don't even know if they have that on YouTube. Um, we'll have oh, to see. They do. You have to log in and say that you're 18. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. So anyway, introduce yourselves. Tell people who the hell you guys are so we can move on with the rest of this show. And find me on Snatch. Shut up. Find me on Twitter. Find me on. Don't find me on Facebook. You can find me there. Find me on Snapchat. Find me on Instagram. Hashtag Billy Fever. Pictures of my cat. Send me money on Venmo. I wear a lucha mask on that app. And you can also find me right now in Melbourne, Florida, on the beach. And and you're who? At Byron Fever, right? Okay, I think we missed that part. Yeah. All right, who's the other guy? I am Casey, at Lucha Gringo. You can find me on the Luxtra Productions YouTube page where I just dropped a short film called From the Shadows. It has ninjas in it. I wrote that shit. I'm an executive producer. I didn't even know I was the fucking executive producer until I saw the credits. It was great. Check it out. Wait, so... Are we singing Go Ninja, Go Ninja, Go for you this week? Go Byron, Ninja, can you handle go, that? Go, 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 go. I kind of have already blocked out <laughs> what I'm what I'm out here doing. I'm, I've been home for like a half hour, and my first thing I do is forget while I'm here. You know, um, so please don't sing that song. No, um, gotcha. I'm out here. I'm out here uh, starting shooting uh, the Vanilla Ice Project season seven. Uh, that's all the information I have for that. Seven. Cool. I'll be home <laughs> in a few days. Well, um, let me jump right into the news so we don't waste too much time here. And, of course, when I say the news, I'm talking about things related to Lucha Underground. Just because the show is off the air, don't think that we're not going to be here trying to inform and entertain with our random knowledge of all things Lucha Underground related. For our, our favorite show, Lucha Underground. Um, and don't get me wrong, there's lots of other shows I like. Uh, Preacher Finale was this week. That was pretty Whoa. awesome. Guys, I read the first comic. Well, then good. You're caught up on pretty much everything that happened in season one because exactly. the entire first season pretty much just added up to the knowledge base of what you get in the very first issue of the comic book. Wait, that Except doesn't... everyone looks different. That doesn't sound right. No, no, really. They just added all sorts of backstory and like really slowed down the story like... In the first issue of the comic book, you know how the church like just blows up and everything? Basically, they took the whole season of the TV show to get to that. Wait, did they show that explosion in slow motion? Was it like 15 minutes? Well, no, there's a version of that in the very first episode of the TV show. You should watch it. You'll like it. Now I'm going to move on to the other favorite TV show we have, which is Lucha Underground. Um, oh, I thought you meant Stranger Things. Fuck. I love that show. I haven't seen the last episode. Dude, Casey's short, the music at the end is better than Stranger Things, and that's amazing because I love the music in Stranger Things. Yeah, that, that composer's pretty dope. His name's in the credits. 
He's got a SoundCloud page. Look him up, people. Yeah, we need. I need yeah, to tag him on our SoundCloud page and and friend him and favorite him and listen to it because it's. So you know, a composer. Awesome. I might need a composer. Um. Anyway, so look, Lucha Underground is not on the air right now. Don't. We're not just crazy. We're not just imagining things. It's not actually not on the air right now. But they did announce that it's coming back September seventh, and that is a very very short time to be off the air. I know a lot of Lucha-related podcasts are like, oh, we're going to take a nice long break. We're going to do this and this. We're going to go to Tahiti for three or four months. Eh. This shit's coming back in less than an, uh, two months. It's, it's only, what, five weeks away at this point. You keep um, rubbing salt in the wound. I had to burn a Tahiti ticket so I can catch the first, <laughs> first episode of the season. Well, so for us, what that means is we've got some cool stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks. Hopefully we got a couple of interviews coming. I'm just having a terrible time scheduling right now. But also, I think we're going to try to do a Lucha draft uh, as soon as we work out the finer points of that. Yes. And, and you guys don't even know this yet. I think I no. want to get together all the Lucha podcasters, um, not necessarily on the show all at once, but I want to get votes from all of them and maybe do something on Twitter where we do a Lucha year-end, uh, Lucha underground year-end awards and come up with some fun categories. I think one episode might be dedicated to just that. Cause Can I just fun. say I don't give a fuck what anyone else thinks? Pentagon wins every category? Well, he's not going to be in every category. That way we know that he can't win every category. If I can find a way to get him in every category, will you rescind that comment? Uh, everything in this world is decided by a series of blowjobs, according to Mr. Show. So... <laughs> All right, good. Good. I, uh, no, I'm interested now. What are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, never mind, Byron. You'll you'll get to it. So, in lucha news this week, PWG. Yeah. Wait, why yeah. is PWG in my lucha news section this week? Because no. because there was all sorts of I, I don't know what was going on on the interwebs, but all sorts of accusations flying about lucha click people sneaking into the PWG show. Uh, PWG 13, which was this past weekend, and um, a guy that we all know who's a pretty cool dude uh, that I've hung out with a couple times at the temple and, you know, I've talked to on the Twitters and the internets, Mil Machetes, was like called out point blank for this whole sneaking in thing, and this shit went on for hours. What was well, going on? Well, the thing on? is, he was off for that whole day, like out on a boat or somewhere. He was somewhere where he wasn't by his phone, I guess, or you know, checking his phone, he was busy the next day. So there was like a solid 12 hours of just accusing and talking shit and this and that, and no rebuttal. No and rebuttal at all. So it look, he looked guilty as shit for a second there of like, why were you not responding to this? And everyone was like, oh, see, no response and blah, blah, blah. But then PWG themselves drops the bomb that, no, no, he's confirmed. He had a ticket. He was all good. So I don't know what the whole shit was about if somebody actually did sneak in, but it wasn't him apparently because, like, PWG took the time out of their day to follow this whole thread because they responded way, way down in this thread. Yeah. To basically say on Twitter, like, no, dude, he's cool. He bought a ticket. He's he's good people. We love him. Like, come back anytime. And I like all those dudes have to just feel stupid that we're trying to put him on blast. Like they have to feel horrible. I think oh, one of them. Man, still, he he still believes in Santa Claus on the story. And it's not really news, but I just figured that I, I'd throw it in here. So, uh, Mill Machetes, we're happy you got your name cleared, especially on some bullshit like that. And and believe me, uh, I am not a fan of getting cut on in line or people sneaking no. in and stuff like that. Like, you know, these the the talent especially, they work hard, and a show like PWG doesn't have the backing of MGM or some big company like, you know, some of these other places do. So, you know, they need the money, and that money goes to the workers, and that's the reason why, like, Bola coming up next month is going to be so fucking off the wall. Don't get me wrong, those ticket prices are crazy. I'm not even going to PWG Bola now because I was like, I want to save my money. Like what, 300 bucks for front row for all three nights now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, I think it's more than that, isn't it? No, it's no, $100 no, it's right plus the fees. Fees, yeah. Oh, yeah, fuck that, man. Well, it's like when you go, then, you're, then you go and buy all the gimmicks that the wrestlers are selling. Look, mm -hmm. look! not everybody is like you that buys every single wrestler that likes t-shirt and mask twice over. 
I don't know, dude. Some of the guys fucked up and didn't even bring shirts. Like, I would have bought a speedball shirt and shit, and he didn't have any with them, man. Yeah, we up. talked to him about that. He said check out his store or something, but it was too late. I wanted to wear a shirt when I was watching him kick Chris Hero in the face. Yeah, now he can't even in America for a while, man. Yeah. But he is in AAA sometimes <laughs> because Mexico doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> At all. Um. That was another question I had, too, and I don't think we ever got a chance to talk about what went on at Comic-Con with Lucha Underground, but are the Lucha guys that are doing BOLA going to be able to use their names? Are they allowed to use their Lucha Underground names in PWG? Does anybody know? I think, I think if they're AAA names, yes. If they're Lucha Underground, no. Jeff Cobb is going to be Jeff Cobb, not the other person that people think that Jeff Cobb is, but I don't fucking break kayfabe, so I'm not right. going to say it. But but the thing is that's how they do independence. I mean you have Jeff Cobb right. doing Jeff Cobb. I mean Johnny Mundo is doing John Hennigan. He's not even throwing his WWE gimmick, but he's a little different. Well, um, but he's been using he's been using Hennigan on the Indies for a while. Like the year leading up to Lucha Underground, he was using yeah. Hennigan again. He had stopped. But if he's in another Morrison. country, he'll use Morrison. If he's not in Triple A, where he can use Mundo, Mundo Triple A. You know, if he's wrestling in the Philippines, he'll be fucking Johnny John Morrison again. Yeah, that's they're his, not gonna find out. That's his Twitter name too. I think he's always Johnny Morrison. But um, yeah, I he's the real Morrison. Morrison. It's standard that any of the guys that Ducha Underground has that they gimmick up themselves, they're already present. They already have a presence on the indies. You know, it's like Ricochet and Puma. The PWG already knows him as Ricochet. So he better not put a mask on. He needs to go there and dance to all night long and, you know, call up his buddy Rich and say he misses him. Speaking uh, of Ricochet, did you see him in the rocket and all buddy buddy on the uh, the Instagrams and Twitters today? Like Ricochet throws out, you know, him standing on the ring buckle, kind of looking like the Rock, and um, you know, put it. I think he put it side by side with the Rock's picture and said some complimentary things about Rock, like you know, he looks up to him and it's one of his inspirations. This that, the other thing. Dwayne responds with like this really heartfelt thing of like. You know, dude, I've seen some of your matches and, and, you know, love what you're doing and you'll be there soon and this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, that was a pretty big public endorsement from The Rock to mm. to Mr. King Ricochet, a.k.a. the former champion of... Under a different Future. name since, since Case Fable, uh, let me say. The Future. weird thing is, is the part when The Rock was like, so should I call you Ricochet, should I call you Puma, should I call you Trevor? And before he answered, he said, it doesn't matter what your name is. <laughs> kind of fucked up. That didn't happen. I, I didn't read any of these tweets, I'm sorry. I was at work all day. <laughs> no, that was, that was brilliant, though. Papers. I mean, it, was, it sure was something. Well, I just wondered, too, though, uh, uh, a very big endorsement like that from Dwayne from The Rock uh, for Ricochet. I just wonder if that does more, you know, the writing on the wall of, of where Ricochet's future is headed. I don't that, think you get an endorsement like that from The Rock for uh, being a Lucha Underground champion. I think you do. I think, I mean, I, I, I kind of agree with your point, but I think The Rock is supportive of Lucha Underground. I think that... I think we're getting to we're getting back to a golden age of wrestling where there are a bunch of a bunch of strong wrestling companies that aren't necessarily fighting tooth and nail. Now that's why, like Jericho. I just listened to Jericho have, with a uh, broken mat on his podcast, and they talked about Impact, and they mm -hmm. and Jericho pushed, uh, you know, pushed, you know. The, the show and like, hey, watch Broken Matt on Impact. He's really turning it around, blah, blah, blah. Well, I, I, again, I, and I think during the Monday Night Wars, I think WWE especially learned this, that competition is not necessarily bad for business. And especially right now, when that competition is clearly not financially um, and ratings-wise anywhere near them. Yeah. So these guys, they, they shouldn't take anyone else as a threat, honestly. Yeah. You know, they don't need to do anyone any favors, and I'm sure they're going to keep everyone in their place, uh, especially people that are selling more merch like New Japan and Ring of Honor with their New Japan stuff. Um, 
But you know, I think I think it is all love out there right now. But I do think the way that Rocky did that was kind of like heralding. It was the trumpeter going to the front of the castle, saying, "Hey, there's a new prince coming to town in a few weeks." Yeah, he was saying you're good, and you're going to be great. But we all know where you go to be great. The big yeah. Man, I gotta I gotta throw in a little rock tangent because uh, some cool stuff got announced uh, last week. Uh, they are doing uh, the SH Figure Arts line, which is this line of Japanese figures. Usually, it's like horror movie characters and Godzilla monsters and Power Rangers. There's like Bruce Lee, there's Michael Jackson, there's Freddie Mercury, all these iconic characters. They're starting to do wrestlers now. And the first series is going to be The Rock, Stone Cold, and then there's a Triple H coming up. But oh. the Stone Cold figure, since we're all big Stone Cold fans on this podcast, and occasionally he comes on this podcast to talk to us, which you can't see right now because, hey, it's on video and he's under contract. He can't appear. But um, Podcast one and the no competes. Exactly. <laughs> but the Stone Cold figure has interchangeable hands to hold the brew dogs that pour out beer into his mouth but also, they have articulated middle fingers, so you can have Stone Cold on your shelf, given the double fingers. It's That's fucking awesome. great. That's badass. I love it. That's a selling point right there. Shit, middle finger hands for a Stone Cold figure? You're not going to see Mattel do that shit? And this is why we keep Casey around, people, because now I'm excited about friggin' action figures again. Like, I wasn't excited about action figures when I started the show tonight, and now I'm like, I, I think I'm going to buy me some action figures. And it's like got, like, different Stone Cold heads, so you can have, like, fucking angry Stone Cold or, like, stoic Stone Cold. And the cool thing is all their heads are interchangeable, so if you want the red Power Ranger to take off his mask and be fucking Stone Cold, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty dope. Um, well, here's one for me to get you guys excited. Maybe you haven't heard about this one yet. Um, Paley... The Paley Center is doing another one of their round of Paley Fest things where they have, like, these TV show roundtables. And they've had some really cool ones in the past, like, especially fanboy-type series where you get, like, the creators and writers of the show and a bunch of the cast. They put them up on stage. They usually screen an episode or something. And then they talk and do, like, a roundtable for the audience and everything. Uh, it's a place called Paley Center here in L.A. And, and it's cool because they kind of, like, are the keepers of cool television over there for the last few decades. So it's mm -hmm. been announced that Lucha Underground is doing one of these on September 9th, I think right after the episode airs. Um, and it, Krista Joseph's going to be there. Eric Van Wagner's going to be there. Skip's going to be there. Uh, I think Katrina. Um, and maybe, I feel like... Morrison might be there. Mundo might be A few other people are going to be there, basically. Brand and they're just going to be there. I might uh -huh. go. Yes, shout out to Brandon120. He's going to be there. Um, who's what? Who's he? Is yeah. that what he just said? Who are you, shout who are you shouting out? Who's Brandon, one? who's going to be there? Brandon, who's writing a new fan theory uh, about why Byron isn't uh, allowed to wrestle in the temple. Oh, oh it's, the fan theory. it's not a theory. It's slash fan fiction of Byron and Barrio Negro. Season four is where I'm gonna make. Oops, I can't spoil it. Never mind. Oh yeah, don't don't spoil it. Don't spoil it. And if it's the alien thing, I think they took that out anyway. The the alien butt crawler thing, they're not gonna. The network said that that was a no go. Let's just say this is my mask when I played that character for season four, and they fucking cut it out. Let's just say <laughs> I'm going to be a new character on the show in Pentagon, or hold on. Where are you going with it? Anyway, so if you want to go to the Paley Fest thing, I think they do still have some tickets. It is open to the public. Um, I don't know where I'm going with it. Casey, write me something. <laughs> okay, Iha de Pimpinella. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> can I still wear a mask? I want a, I want a second layer on my butthole. No, you can have, like, a pretty lady mask, like Leatherface, in the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. You can just cut off some girl's face and put it over your face. I don't do that. I'm a feminist. That's very scary. You're oh, you're effeminate. Right. You're effeminate. Feminist. Effeminate. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Uh, wait. Look at his fucking hair. Oh, is the connection bad? I think the connection might be breaking up a little bit. But I, yeah, I caught the effeminate. Like Bubbles Flintstone right now. I don't know what's going on with the Are video. We Are we still talking about Instagram? You know, you know that this version is is on video. Like a lot of people are just going to listen to the podcast, but you know that people can actually see this video, right? 
What? Yeah, yeah you should show yeah. them your dope ass view, dude, from your hotel room, the uh, the beach. I know that. What are you talking about? Oh, never mind. This is why Casey. I should have set up all the technical stuff with you, Byron. It was it was a waste of time to do it with Byron. All right. Well, here's our new oh, segment. You guys want to start? Well, let's start the podcast right now, Byron, because we haven't been doing that already for the last I don't know 15, 20 minutes. I so, wanted to talk about this thing with the rock and ricochet. <laughs> we should talk about that tonight. Yeah, that'd be great. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Hey, another new thing I'm going to do tonight, we're going to do our Lucha Rewind. And there's a, there's a very specific episode that I really want to talk about that we've mentioned a little bit in the past. Actually, two episodes, three hours of Lucha that I kind of want to talk about real quick. Just real mm-hmm. quick. Because our, our near and dear friend, the Lucha Gringo, Casey Nielsen, had a starring part in one of these episodes. So yeah, what I'm going to do this week's Lucha Rewind is back to the finale of Season 1, Ultima Lucha Uno. I feel like Uno. I should be saying this all back. I, I remember uh, Casey and I had front row seats, and he's like, I got to go take care of something, and he walked backstage, and then, um, and then another part-time contributor to the show tried to follow him backstage, and then wasn't allowed. <laughs> By the way, yeah, I, wanna... uh, I remember seeing Brandon almost get tackled by security, and I just kept walking. I want to give a shout out right now to a hot tub guy who was also a believer backlash um, uh, for uh, for really cracking Hernandez on the dick as hard as he could with the that belt. was that was awesome. But hey, wait, wait, we'll get there. Let's do this kind of like it's a regular episode. Um, I want to talk about, and, and I'm not going to talk forever about this stuff because a lot of people have seen it. And if you haven't seen it, um, do yourself a favor. Don't just watch Ultimate Lucha 1. Um, get it on iTunes. Watch every single episode leading up to it. And then crap your pants a little bit because yeah. um, I remember, I think I, was, I think I was there when this was first announced and we were all just like, Ultima Lucha, what? Dario's just in the ring screaming and like we could barely understand. We were like, what is an Ultima Lucha? There was no context for it at the time, and we were all just kind of like, okay, this sounds big. And it did sound big, right? And that was the promo where he kept fucking up, right? And then they had to go give him a glass of water because his voice kept cracking? Yeah, yeah, and that was like only the second or third taping I think I was ever at. And it was like, wow. Was like, what did I get into? <laughs> Yo's not getting through this, is he? <laughs> I think there was still uh, what chance, too. And then he's like, say what if you fuck your mom or something. <laughs> Stop. I hope he said yeah, that in he Spanish. Said you can only chant what at that piece of shit promotion. This is the temple, and you say K. <laughs> K. No one does a K chant, which is good. No, no, no. No, he said no, but yeah, there was a little bit of a thing with the what chants, but yeah, I remember though. Like we we don't speak Spanish, but they were doing English and Spanish uh, promos, and somehow I I just I remember Casey who doesn't have good Spanish because I was in Spanish class with him. I know what grades he got. Yeah, all we did was talk about wrestling the whole fucking time, so we didn't learn shit. In some of case, he still knew. He still knew Ultima Lucha was going to be like the Lucha WrestleMania. Well, and that's what that's what Casey, I remember Casey saying that that day because I was just like, oh, what is this? Some cheesy like another unique opportunity thing, except with like bigger words. I just like when when Dario first said it, I was kind of like, and Casey was like, no, dude, this is going to be like the new WrestleMania. F WrestleMania. This is where yeah. it's at. And this was, you know, before this past WrestleMania, so it was just like no one was looking forward to regular WrestleMania as it was. And then slowly over the weeks, we all started to realize that, holy shit, this really is going to be a big deal. This is going to be the season finale. Because I don't even think I knew at the time if they were going to, like, just try to keep running like a WWE or if they were going to really take yeah. a season off. We all knew that they had a certain amount of episodes. But I just kind of figured since it was wrestling, maybe they would just keep going uh indefinitely but then it became more apparent that like Ultima Lucha 1 is going to be the end of the season it's going to be this big deal and fuck me I couldn't make it to it I am still really really mad at myself for that I had enough fun for both of us Justin you made one day didn't you or not to Ultima Lucha 1 oh yeah that's right you were working that's something that yeah, and I was working on the weekend that particular week, too, so I couldn't get out of it. I was going to try to fly back, and then, like, shit hit the fan on the show I was working on, and we had yeah. a, a big trailer rally that day. So, yes, I produce reality television also. You're probably like, why are these reality TV guys all sitting around talking about wrestling? 
well, but damn it, yeah, reality TV guys cool. make this particular wrestling show, so yeah. F you guys. Yeah. I'm not a reality guy, but I want to say F you guys too, just in case, but just in case you piss me off somehow. I don't know. Hey, hey look, Mr. Hollywood. Yeah, you're the one with the EP credit this week. You're the big shot this week. Yeah, you're just like, you're you're on the same level as like EV Dub and De Joseph and those guys, right? Oh. No, DJ's only a co-EP on Lucha. Oh, no. He's Dude. super jealous of you, Casey. Yeah, don't I big time. I really doubt that, but I hope he at least watches my short to see how I would book ninjas and keep that <laughs> on. Did you, did you, you should tweet it at him. Or, or I should, you... but I'm not one of those people. I, I don't tweet not... people individually to promote something that I do because I have people do it to me and that just makes me angry. <laughs> well, no, I take care of all the mass ob obnoxious tweeting in this family, I think. And I try to do it without getting people mad at me like Byron does. I get people mad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, you should apologize to DJ in advance right now just in case you say something again that pisses him off, Byron. <laughs> I, I tweeted once. To, to Dario that I saw someone wearing a Dario shirt and I said that the man was a, a man of class because the guy wearing the shirt I thought was classy for wearing the shirt and he tweets me back fucking talking shit saying he was uh, I, I, that I should have added in grandeur and then he tagged all the heels by the way shout out to the heels oh is that what you're wearing yeah I oh. wondered why you looked like you should be on a farm. Dude, the heels fucking broke up. Are you going to wear a Rockers shirt next? Jesus Christ. Hey, J-Man is still the last real heels, and it's still a strong show. Yeah, yeah Hans, Hans is in there now, the right? The capacity mm -hmm. of co-hosts. Where's Urban? He's off being the Shawn Michaels somewhere. I don't know, man. He's, like, doing weird videos or some shit now. He's, like, I don't know what he's doing. He's, like, off the uh, off the reservation, I think. Yeah, I, I saw one of those. I thought I was watching like the Blair Witch Project or something. I got like really scared and I stopped watching it. I just want to know if we need an intervention. Is the guy all right? Like, should we send help to Tennessee? I think a big, big factor in interventioning Urban is uh, how much a plane ticket costs to go to Tennessee. Sounds pretty okay. expensive. You're close though. Forget anyway. intervention. Um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll uh, drop a note next time I cross the country on a plane. Um, but I will say this. I remember um, speaking of the subject uh, back when uh, EV Dub mentioned he still has this WrestleMania 1 shirt. That was a big factor, actually, for, for me getting my Ultima Lucha 1 shirt. I don't even wear it. I just I have it as that moment, memento because it's it was a historical moment in wrestling history, I think. And I, really, and I agree with you. And so that was kind of the point that I was getting to 10 minutes ago before we went off on this tangent, which people <laughs> wonder why the show gets to be so long. Um, and I let it happen. It's totally my fault. So, Josh Pillow, if you're listening, whatever five minutes of your life you just gave us, it's my fault. I, I didn't stop anyone from going down that tangent road. And I'm still doing it right now. So, anyway, my whole point about Ultima Lucha 1 was it really, uh, to me, is where Lucha Underground really turned the corner. And that's the reason why I wanted to do it as the first rewind. I didn't want to go back to the first episode because as groundbreaking and crazy as the first episode was in a certain uh, aspects, I don't think it was what really lit the world on fire the same way that Ultima Lucha did. Ultima Lucha was the moment when people who weren't watching Lucha Underground, who didn't know jack about AAA or CMLL, like, that was the day that people were like, oh, what the fuck is this promotion? What is going on over here? There's this whole other thing. And, you know, I know a ton of people were, like, asking me after that aired, like, where can I see this show? Can I go back and get it? You know, how do I watch this? What network is it on? Like, people were asking questions immediately. And that was after the first episode when Casey was starring, probably. See, it's the Casey factor. Mm -hmm. always the ratings. Always. God. Son of a bitch. Anyway. People with belts, what can I say? <laughs> so Casey, it was big. How did you get in that match, Casey, by the way? Oh, dude, it was awesome. Uh, Specifically, just say my name. Oh, so basically, um, the, the wonderful Krista Joseph uh, put on Twitter just asking who was coming to Ultima Lucha. And uh, I had my young boy, Byron Turk, say <laughs> that I was going to be there. 
And that got me on the show. He completely ignored the fact that Byron was going to be there, and Lord knows we could have used another lumberjack or two, but maybe he thought he was too ugly for television because we do have pictures of ourselves as our Twitter profile, so he knew what he was getting himself into when he hired me as official whipper. I think I think that he thought that he couldn't afford T.J. Miller at the, the his current rates. Exactly. He didn't want people to think that they were watching the fucking Yogi Bear movie and change the channel. So he brought me on instead because uh, he said I made a really good belt making uh, face, which they use in all the highlight videos. Me going. Uh. I wish I had a belt right now so I could go err for you, but you know what? I'm not a one-trick pony here. I could barely even say it just then, but you know what? It was it was fucking wonderful. It was one of the best moments of my life hitting Hernandez with that belt. Okay, so here's what I got to ask you as a fan, and I don't know the answer to this question, so I'm going to ask you because I would ask anyone. Well, you guys I... all come out. Not you. I'm talking to Casey. I thought you said you were a fan of me. No, no but I know you think you have fans, but anyway, so... You guys got to come out and do an entrance, and dude, it was it was the Lucha All Star cast. By the way, it was you. Um, let's see who came out first. Vic came out first. Who yeah, yeah. Striker calls the Counting Crows guy, which is, <laughs> Vic will Vic will never live that down ever. No one is ever going to let him live that down. It's amazing. I will never stop calling him that. And then uh, I think your uh, J Man's right behind him. Then you. Then Urban. Um, I know Marco's back in there, a couple other faces, um, and I think Marco actually gets called out, and last night he get called out. Did they call you out, Case? I don't even remember. Fuck no, and they cut the entrance. There were two cameras, right? There was one that was right at the front of the entrance, like, like I'm looking at you right now, and there was one at the bottom of the steps. And they switch to the one at the bottom of the steps. You can see me at the top of the steps throw a fucking Cerro Miedo right into the camera. Oh. And they didn't use that shot. Your, your love damn. of Pentagon had no place in that match, man. It was all about your hatred for baby nuts. That's what the, the thing nuts. was. They also <laughs> cut out the part where I climbed in the ring and I broke Drago's arm after the match. That's nah. horrible. They're so mean. I saw you trying to hug him. I love Drago too much, and his tongue is scary, and he could probably like lick his way out of the arm <laughs> lock because he's all gross and slimy and shit, which I know because I hug that motherfucker. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So, wait, so here's my question about this, your ring entrance before we get to Drago. Mm-hmm. Did you guys get to go backstage? Did you come out of the locker room? Where'd you guys come from? We actually... Um, and was Katrina back there? Yeah, yeah, just get No, um, you know who was back there was um, Chavo was back hey. there, and uh, Conan, and I didn't see Conan until we came back, but because it's really dark up there actually, and uh, it makes me think that Chavo eats a lot of carrots because he shook all of our hands as we were coming back, and it was super dark, and he was like shaking our hands before I even knew he was there, so it's like. Dude's got night vision. Chavo has super. Wait, 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 wait. Chavo was eating carrots backstage? Ooh, right. That, that, that means that Chavo is probably the rabbit tribe. Could be. That's why he could see in the dark. Wait, it, were those carrots also cigar shaped inside of a limo? He's yes, and I heard the Guerrero is Spanish for rabbit. Read <laughs> it out. <laughs> it really isn't. But why, uh, why? I'm the one who didn't take Spanish. You know that that's, that's not true. Can I tell you that we may or may not have walked through Matanza's cage on the way? You told oh. me. It, it was that kind of dark, though? Yeah, but um, they there's like a little cool area up there, and we walked through that, you know. We walked through all the smoke and shit, and we're like, oh, this is awesome. We get the equivalent of Pyro in the Lucha Underground world, the smoke. Did you see any of Bale's remains? No, he was um, cleaned up well, probably. I don't know. I think Matanza has been sucking on Bale's bones for a long time. They're like whittled down to toothpicks now. Oh, there's I, gotta be part of the air. I think that Marty the Moth has him and uses him as a bath toy, but um, that's neither here nor there. Uh, once we made the entrance, uh, you can't hear it on TV, but my friends in the peanut gallery started a Casey Nielsen chat, and it was thunderous. Casey Nielsen. 
I don't remember. I don't remember that. I was ringside. Fuck, I do. I started doing the fucking Hogan ear thing at you guys and shit because it I was before Hogan the Hogan was known as a filthy racist. I thought you were doing a Hogan ear, yeah, because you grew up in Tampa, as they say. <laughs> oh. No, I think J. I think J. Ray broke you out with that chant. Byron was probably off in La La Land, staring at the rafters. Yeah, he was looking for Sting <laughs> to, to, to repel in. I'm a big fan. Is anyone ever going to do that gimmick in Lucha Underground? Somebody's got to... Oh, you don't do fucking rappelling in anymore? Why? Is it too oh, soon? No. Like, I don't know why you don't do it. I'm just saying. Like, you know, Owen Hart died doing that. No. On the paper. Is that what happened? You say it like I don't know. Like, I wasn't was watching was that pay-per-view. Like, that. I wasn't mortified for the rest of my life after seeing that. Why are you smiling while you talk about it? I smile when I talk about everything. I'm a nice guy. I'm friendly. Why are you masturbating while you talk about it? Yeah, yeah, why? Come on, Justin. That's a notepad. I'm doing <laughs> oh, okay. <a> notepad. <laughs> why are you have a dick-shaped notepad, Justin? <laughs> well, that's just a personal problem that I have with ballast-shaped things. This isn't um, going to work on the, the video feed, though, because they can clearly see it's a regular notepad. You're going to have to get a dick-shaped notepad. No, look, it's got a, it's got a little... It's It's kind of... Balancing. Yeah, it's kind of shaped like Byron's dick, all small and white and shit. No, what a dick. Like. Um, so your dick looks like. Anyway, let me talk. Well, we already started talking about Believer's Backlash, so let's just talk yeah. about that match for a minute. Because the thing I noticed in rewatching this is I remember how amazing those Drago entrances were in that whole first season. Like, he, yeah. he had the best entrance. And for people who haven't been to the temple... There's no music being piped in like WWE. It's like just like maybe the band's playing, but it's not like somebody's entrance music hits and you pop for their music. You don't pop until you see them, and and the the talent themselves is responsible for getting you hyped up for them for the match. Period. There's no pyro. There's no video package. There's no sound half the time, and every time Drago would come out, man, it was like people would go insane. And this was probably one of his best interests of the whole season. Yeah. Yeah, this was... Um, he started with the wings after he came back because he lost that loser leaves the temple thing. Right. So when he came back, he needed that little extra. So he had the wings with him and he had the more silvery face with the more paint. I have Not that mask. Paint. Good gracious, I like a pile more paint. What were you going to say, yeah. Mark? I have that mask. We've used it in some of our pictures. Yeah, that, that mask is good. dope. We didn't know he was... all of our podcast pictures when we post that, which yeah. sucks because now we're never going to use anything other than that Pentagon one because it came out so fucking great. <laughs> yeah, that thing's badass. Even though I look I look kind of like the gimp in that thing, but that's all right. <laughs> yeah. I'll take one for the team. <laughs> Casey, remember uh, when Drago came back? The first time he did that, the, the entrance with the wings? That mm -hmm. was fucking awesome. Yeah. That was my first, that was my first Lucha Underground tape. Oh, that's right. Dude, we were... Yeah. Yeah. His on TV, he had just left. Yeah. Which was hilarious because it was like, yeah, I watched the episode where he left that week, that Wednesday, and then that Saturday, I saw the return of Drago. I was like, oh, that was fast. He just left. Yeah. Well, shit. How, we how they let him back in. But that was a badass match, too. They did a lot of cool shit. I mean, Hernandez is baby nuts, but he did some cool shit. Yeah. 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 Fucking Especially Drago busting like out the nunchucks. Point. Like, shit, man, why didn't you give us nunchucks to hit him with instead of belts if you're going to use nunchucks? Because their nunchucks, uh, nunchucks suck back uh, season one. He yeah, was, he broke him over his head. <laughs> and then it flew into the crowd. Probably. No, that was the funny thing. And then he starts to go to use them again, and there's like only half a nunchuck there, and he's just like, whoop, and then he goes right to this, the next spot or whatever. Yeah, it's like, all right, I'll just spit in his eyes instead. <laughs> um, so let that me ask you this. Mm -hmm. It's Wancha that Hernandez did to the floor, head first. Oh yeah, it was crazy. There was there was some crazy spots in that match all around. Yeah, um, fucking whiskey. So I gotta um I gotta ask you this question, Casey. Mm -hmm. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know, uh, Drago hits the splash for the win, basically at the end of the table spot and the nunchucks and the and the Casey whipping the shit out of baby nuts. Um. So, like, over a year or so later, are you sad that Hernandez is gone? Because the more I think back about it now, we had so much fun healing on that guy. Like, just treating him like 
complete crap to the point where they wrote a match for you guys to literally beat the f out of this guy. I can't go but, with yeah, you know, I was always a fan of Hernandez's work in TNA because the fucking border toss is awesome. It's amazing. <laughs> and in TNA especially because he was like throwing people yeah. everywhere. And despite being a heel, he I don't want to like blow up his shit, but he's like the nicest fucking guy in the world. And he was really cool to us before the match. And uh, really cool for having that be his idea to get fucking whipped like that. Because he's been in a match like that before, but he was on the other side. So he was sitting there watching the other people get the shit beat out of them. Oh. And, he, and he thinks, oh, that's that's going to be my thing. And uh, I know things would be a lot different if he stayed. I know that a lot of people have heard from a lot of different places that he was originally going to be Matanza. And uh, I don't know if I would have liked him in that role as much as I like the current Matanza, who shall rem remain nameless and totally isn't Jeff Cobb. Uh, yeah, no, I think the, I think the current Matanza is is a bit more athletic with uh, the suplexes and whatnot, and you would not have gotten that from Hernandez. I think people bitch about the height too much because when they originally shot that segment where they're all looking up at Matanza, I think Hernandez was still Matanza at the time, if those rumors are true. I would believe that. I could see that totally. But it does um, make sense that Matanza and, and Dario are similar in height. No, and plus, dude, not all monsters are tall, dude. Freddy fucking Krueger is, like, 5'2", and will fuck you up. Yeah, but he can you extend know? his arms out to, like, scratch the garages on both sides of the street. Kane it. Hodder is Jason. Kane Hodder isn't six feet tall. He will fuck you up, and he's basically who Matanza's kind of based on a little bit movement-wise, I think. I think he's taken a lot out of the Kane Hodder playbook for that. I think so. I would agree. I agree, too. Oh, and a uh, pro tip for all you fans out there. If you meet Kane Hodder at a convention and take a picture with him, don't tell him to choke you because he'll really fucking do it. <laughs> he, he doesn't have any control over that. I, I think he's used to guys with a lot more neck muscle. Well, it didn't happen to me. It happened to a friend of mine, but I, I eventually found out he does it to everyone. That's messed up. I will definitely remember not to do that because that's probably the first thing I would do because I'm a dumbass like that. Um... Well, so let me quickly just talk about the other couple of matches from the first night. And um, what were the other matches? Let's see. Hey, the, oh, Mac versus Cage. Mac versus Cage was amazing. Well, and the reason, the, the reason why historically I think that this match is so important in going back and watching it is because this is the match that made working on top of the office roof um, work so much later. Like when Matanza and Mill go through the roof later, the reason why that shocked the crap out of me was because there's a spot in this cage and Mac match where there's a suplex and a hard one onto that exact same spot on the roof, and it looks like the hardest bump anyone's ever taken in the temple. Like that thing is not, has no give. It looks like it's like concrete floor. Yeah. I like that match a lot better on TV because I couldn't fucking see what the finish of the match was because it was right above me. So the yeah, office was on the way of the curb stomp onto the bricks. Well, we were right front and center for the for the stunner, which was yeah. We got beer all over us, um, but Knox got it worse because I think Willie Mac intentionally sprayed all the beer into his crotch when he did the stunner. <laughs> <laughs> It definitely looks like it if you see the still that they used to promote the match. It's basically like, spray him in the dick. Good God. I have to go back and look at that. Oh, you, you have to. That, that match is awesome to watch, and it really is good for TV. Um, yeah, I just the, the spots on top of the, the office, too. There was a spine buster up there that also I was just like, God dang, what are you guys doing? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and there's a cinder block finish, but... I wasn't a huge fan of the cinder block finish the way that they did it because Mac's face is only like an inch off of it and then the whole thing is like powder. It's like it was made out of dry toothpaste. And they definitely just like babe, jeez. Yeah, but look, I'm it's just it's my one critique of the match it was just like like I liked the spot ending with the, the, the cinder block, but I felt like it should have been like a, a choke slam onto it or something to make it look like there was more impact. He does it from like an inch away. You know who else did a curb stomp on concrete center blocks? Fucking nobody, because no other promotions count. 
All right. Uh, let's just say someone had to take a month off to make a movie, so he got curb stomped. Who makes movies from wrestling these days? The Rock. Well, not that anyone would know because no one watches them, but, you know. Um, yeah, you know, Pentagon stars in a lot of movies. He just doesn't have his mask on, so you guys wouldn't know that he is really fucking Vin Diesel under that mask. I'd rather be Pentagon. No. Yeah, Flip I, would too. Notes. I have so many notes about Casey and back Believer's Backlash that I didn't even need to write down because he covered them all. That I, Oh, the other match was uh, the DOD versus uh, Team What's-His-Havoc. Yeah, dude, I thought, okay, like, me and Byron thought Angelico fucked himself up on that dive. You remember that shit? He was, like, coughing up blood. Off uh, the other office. Yeah, right, no, yeah. so that dive, that dive is off the dude. deep platform, the platform that's behind the announce table, that's yeah. behind an entire section of bleachers. And we were there. Like, we were, like, looking straight up at him as he came down. It was awesome. Was that spot even supposed to happen that way? Because the cameras were not even in good position. Like, and Helico's just up there. There's so much action going on other places. And then, like, all of a sudden, he just runs and and does a, uh, a dive onto a couple of guys. Like, and that was a crazy dive. I mean, he literally cleared at least a third of the bleacher section. Yeah. That was insane, and when he landed, he hit very hard. It was a loud thud. Felt like hitting a wet blanket with a tennis racket. He, was a, he came by and hugged us after the match. He was okay. Yeah, well, he hugged you guys. because You were probably was, crying, Byron. You were probably out. like, I can't believe a Helico is hurt. No, no, no. We, we were cheering for the, for the uh, Disciples of Death the whole oh. time, and people were getting mad. We are like, fuck him up, yeah! So the Havoc would get punched in the face, or we're cheering, and people in the temple don't like it when you cheer against Son of Havoc. Oh, yeah. Um, that dude, um, Marcos, got really pissed at us for cheering for the Disciples of Death. Uh, but I fucking love that guy. He's a good dude. Yeah. Oh, man. I, I that... love Oh, wait, was Smashly there too? Because uh, Smashly hates me because every time she's around when Havoc's in a match, I just happen to like the other person more. And I really do like Son of Havoc. But like every time he, she's there, he's against somebody that I love. No, actually she wasn't. The first time J-Man and Urban just came out by themselves, or she probably would have been in the Believer's Backlash also. Oh, she would have been amazing in that. That would have been hilarious if Smashly was in In fact... I'm glad she wasn't, because she probably would have hauled off and hit Hernandez, like, strapped him all the way around the neck, choked him out, and then he would have been like, what, what are you doing? And the old Justin Roberts? Oh. What? What? What are you doing, Byron? Um, but anyway, yeah, so that, that match was interesting, because I thought for sure when DOD won there... And DOD actually looked really good in this match, by the way. Those three guys were... I'm, I'm very sad that they're no longer with us, but um, or the majority of them is no longer with us, and I mean exactly a majority. Um, but because they... That was a great match. And it was like, this was one of the first times where it was like, wait, these guys are definitely better than jobbers, um, you know, and they really let them shine a little bit in that match. It was surprising. Well, what's that, Casey? Where's yeah. Casey going? Oh, I just needed some more light. Oh, look at that, all dramatic and shit. Oh, oh. I like that. I thought it was a great match. I thought um, everyone looked really good. Eva Lee looked great, you know. And yeah, she, she was really good at one getting leg. a rock in the face. What were you saying, Casey? She was really good at getting a rock in the face. Yeah, but the, they did something awesome there. They set up Eva Lee and Katrina, which mm -hmm. we saw play out in, in season two. That's like a, a slow burn between the two of them. Which... Well, and I like that. A lot of stuff in this these episodes was kind of that way. And um, I'm going to say this. You said everyone looked good, but honestly, look-wise, this was Katrina's worst look, I think, that she's had in the actual temple. Um, I like the attire she was wearing in the second night of Ultima Lucha much better when she came out to valet for Mill. I think maybe because she knew she was getting physically involved in this match, but she's like wearing just plain black, and it's not even her. She looks great. I'm just saying, like, she came out in a really plain black leotard kind of outfit. She looked like she was going yeah. to Saturday morning yoga and not, like, putting herself together to go to battle like she normally does in the temple. So I was kind of like, that was the only disappointment. I'm nitpicky, huh? 
I don't you, know. Are, you are now officially the Mr. Blackwell of the Triple M show, critiquing fashion in such a way. But I do got to say they kept Dee strong because she had the gimpy leg and it still took The Rock to beat her. Yeah, and I like that. I like that whole finish. Um, you know, and I, and I like, you know, the fact that DOD had been a little bit on jobber status. You can't just have them go over clean here. I don't think that would have made sense. I mean, they're powerful because they're with Katrina and she's aligned with Mills. So her going over with the with the rock finish and the lick of death. Plus you get the lick of death from Katrina on Ivalice. Who wouldn't book that? Oh, and I got to say, shout out to Trace because since we were cheering for the Disciples of Death so, so much, they started fucking everyone up like right in front of us. Um, <laughs> And that was awesome. <laughs> and then they, then they started liking our pictures on Instagram. I mean, this was also the moment, too, where I'm just like, damn, I, I was hoping for a better run out of Team Havoc or whatever they were being called. Yeah. Um, Whereas, like, I wish I had seen more of them earlier in the season. The latter match where she, you know, went through the whole thing with the gimp leg or whatever was great when they got the belts, but... It just kind of shows you that, like, this team being in and out of their injury statuses is really unfortunate for Lucha Underground. It's one of the few spots where, like, I think the real world kind of fucked up what, you know, was going on backstage that would have been even better. Yeah. And they, they still did right by, by them as a team, and they get a good segment at the end of the, the second episode or whatever, but it was kind of unfortunate. It was like, yeah... They, the belts are off of them now. We don't know if, what it's going to be like for them in Season 2, but it did set up good anticipation for Season 2, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, that was it for the first night, but the the other things that played out were the um, the Dragon Azteca Senior vignettes and starting to set up the whole Lotus thing, yeah. um, which, of course, Casey... You, you being the Lucha Underground historian that you are, can probably explain better what the storyline is here. But we kind of start off with them tell with a hooded, and by hooded I mean in a hoodie yeah. <laughs> figure telling Dragon Azteca, "Hey, the prophecy says if you go in the temple, you're gonna die." And Dragon Azteca is just like, "I have to go in there, you know. I have to save her from." Dario, her, of course, being Lotus, right? Right, and they get this information because Prince Puma is their inside man that was giving them this information. Right, and he tells Azteca in this scene, like, hey, let let Puma handle it, and Azteca's like, I can't do that, man. I gotta, I gotta get in there and get involved. Yeah, Dragon Azteca Sr. fucked up. <laughs> yep. He, well, Dragon Azteca Sr. died from, like, a punch to the back. She shattered his spine with the fucking spine-shattering blow. You need to watch more fucking martial arts movies, bro. It was basically the touch of death. Yeah, and no, they set it up to... What are you saying, Byron? The touch of death is in the front. Everyone knows that. No, no, look, look. They set, it, they set the whole thing up, too, because the other uh, segment, I believe it's in this episode or the next episode, is the one where Dario basically reveals to her, or tells her his version of the truth, which is that um, it was not him that was responsible, that it was actually Dragon Azteca that started this whole thing and that, you know. And she's already in her in her cell training, and if you watch, she's doing the death touch on the wall. She's, like, breaking pieces of cement and concrete, doing her force powers, man, which was pretty And in bad. earlier episodes, Dragon Azteca is the one showing her how to do that shit. Yeah, oh, no. circle. So Dragon Azteca signed his own death warrant. Well, he did the second he stepped into the temple. You know, you gotta listen to the prophecies, man. That's the truth, man. That's when they tell you not to go in. You know, if you haven't watched that movie, you're a dumbass. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. saying. So anyway, I like I like those segments in this, and I think Ultima Lucha One in general was so well crafted. Um, vignette wise like a little bit of it was hot shotting like they did so many vignettes especially towards the end um, because everybody all their main characters got some focus but this was kind of us seeing what the future of Lucha Underground was really going to be like we'd seen a lot of vignettes but a lot of them were just the setup pieces that they still do but this episode was really like all these stories are going to keep going and this is how we're going to really build and tell yeah. stories 
Also, they had to do it because they didn't know if they were going to be moving the temple, so you notice that everyone's story is them going away from the temple somewhere else, including Dario. Yeah, which I loved. Um, so, I guess what, let's talk about the matches from, from day two. Fuck um, yeah. I'm going to start with Gift of the Gods because... Yeah. I, well, the opening match, I think, is significant right now in the news because it was a good match, and I thought it was great for the feud that it was about, but someone involved had a big gripe that he was in the opening match. And then he left to go somewhere. Oh, you're talking about the Mundo ADR match. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And talking about that crybaby bitch, Alberto Del Rio. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that because this match in, in Ultima Lucha, and it does kind of relate, this is like, honestly, I felt like at the time this was lazy booking. And maybe it was, it, it was a great match. These guys had a great match. Don't yeah. get it wrong. Don't get it twisted. And ADR. we were fired up, man, and we were in Alberto's corner. I fucking caught his scarf, man. I let you have it, and I'm now I'm glad I did. You didn't <laughs> let me have it, my fucking iron grip from all that practice of the fucking claw hold. Oh, that's all your really? stuff, me personally. When you're home alone. <laughs> Masturbating. Not that kind of claw hold, Byron. No. Oh. You gotta make everything about jerking off, dude. I don't know what your problem is, Byron. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway... What I was saying is, I, at the time, I didn't like this booking because it felt too WWE to me. It felt like I was watching a great intercontinental match between ADR and and Johnny Whoa. Hollywood or whatever. Um, you know, and it was I was kind of ticked at the time because I wanted to see like Puma and and Mundo for the belt or something. I wasn't really. I I love the the putting Mill in that position too, but at the same time, I felt like Mundo should have been higher on the card. I felt like there was a better place for ADR. Those two guys fighting each other didn't do much for me, though I did love Alberto bringing the AAA belt to the ring with him. Yeah. Had he done that before that point in time yeah. in season one? Yeah. I don't remember. Been with him yeah. the whole time. That's how Tejano yeah. came. Uh, also, uh, are you guys, uh, you know, Molina ran in and... Yeah, uh, too, too <laughs> that, but. but that never happened in continuity now is my theory. Because I actually think that Lucha Underground did a retcon here. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that term. Yeah. Do you Comic think that for Taya? Yeah, because, it, well, it's a retroactive continuity thing, right? So when they did Season 2 and they had Mundo, they did have them talk about running ADR out of Lucha Underground, which he did, but he did. they never once mentioned Molina again or her interference. So Yeah, why would you? I mean, if she's not going to come into the company and be a player, I would never mention her again. I just, I almost wish they could go back and re-edit it and just put Taya into it now. That would have been awesome, actually. CGI her in there, like some green screen shit. Put a couple of fucking like dragons in there. Cage or something. No, but Molina was too busy posting pictures of uh, Johnny Mundo's Viagra and HDH medications. Oh, it was Cialis, and um, she posted that the weekend that Taya debuted as his manager. Interesting coincidence. Hmm, I wonder if she was a little bit jealous. I don't know. She says that she came to the decision not to come back with the Lucha Underground people, and you know what? If DJ verified that, which he did, I'm going to go with that story. Yeah, I, I mean, who knows? I I was interested for a moment when she did the run-in. Like, I thought it was kind of interesting. But then the same thing happened to me where I was just like, this is too WWE. The whole yeah. finish was a bit WWE. Though, Mundo going through the door window was friggin' amazing. Dude, and there was so much fucking fake blood all over his yeah. face because that was not a blade job. But, yeah. uh... He's too, yeah. he too pretty for that. He too pretty the way for that. He, the way that she carried him out with a towel over his head, too, was like um, the Toxic Avenger when um, the guy is wearing the towel over his head and he's like, I'm not an animal. I'm Melvin the Mop Boy. You know, I don't even think Byron's ever seen that movie. I saw the what? movie in Montreal with, with uh, Uncle Lloyd. You saw... Return to Newcomb High. That doesn't even have the Toxic Avenger in it. I saw that. I saw that when he was showing it in New York. I saw the Toxic Avenger at the Montreal 
a horror film fest at Comic Con. We were discussing, Justin and I, a new segment on this podcast where we make you watch good movies so that you can become a man. And yeah, I think you need to to spend a little more time with the trauma library before you get a little too too far ahead of yourself, Byron. I, I watched War on YouTube because Casey told me to. Oh, that's, that's a good recommendation. Okay. That's good. That's solid. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and I've seen the Toxic Avenger. I just told you I saw it in Montreal. That wasn't what you watched in Montreal. I know what you saw in Montreal. You saw Bret Hart get screwed out of the WWF Championship by Shawn Michaels and Vince McMahon. Bring that up every single year. <laughs> That would be really awful and played Fine. Out. Look, Tromeo and Juliet next week, right here. <laughs> uh, I think we should make them watch the original class of Newcomb High. Yeah, that'd probably be a much better place to start. Or Redneck Zombies. Um, Redneck Zombies is pretty good. I'm a big John know, Waters it, fan, too. I kind of want him to watch Pink Flamingos. I well, wanna... I don't think he... I think that would ruin his life. Um, is he not there yet? What were we talking about, Lucha? I can talk about B-movies all day. Mundo, Mundo, Molina, ADR. We're talking about WWE comes to LU. It was like the WWE 50 match, but but booked a little bit better, where it was a little 50-50, where one guy won, and then the other guy beat him up. But they went a little bit better, where they had you know a massive fake blade job, and Del Rio looked like he... You know, kind of got one over on um, yeah. Mundo for cheating. Mundo but, came out um, looking like the Elephant Man and shit with a towel over his head. It was, but it did just it was not it was not the match to end their feud. I don't know if it was meant to. Well, now who who actually went over? Mundo because Mundo he oh, that's right. the next show and said he did, and that's how it works. Right. So Molina no, comes in, and then Mundo and goes he... over after the run in, and then ADR puts him through the window. He yeah. had to get his feet back. Yeah. But here's here's the winner of that. Um, Mundo fans. stayed in Lucha Underground, and he had, he got Taya um, and Worldwide Underground in season two. Whereas all I gotta say, all I gotta say is that I'm not done. Whereas Mundo's face isn't on a missing poster. Went well, well, from opening match in Lucha to opening match in WWE, and then went down on the card. To where he wasn't even top fiddle in a stable with Sheamus and Rusev, and now he's not even on TV. Did he even get drafted on TV, or was he just the supplemental draft? Was he drafted at all? I don't. I think he's on his way out. You think so? Is he going to come back to Lucha? <laughs> no. <laughs> Got a new old lady. That's all he did. What'd you say? What? He what? wasn't going to come back to Lucha. Anyway, because he already was just a triple A guy when he went to WWE. Well, so, welcome to TNA ADR. Well, can't wait. Can't He'll wait. be up and run again. Oh, oh I did want to. I did want to say this. Um, getting into the second episode, Vampiro's not on commentary in this episode, which makes this a very, very unique episode. And Michael Chavello is oh. in there, which I loved. I don't get me wrong. I did not. I would not want to hear him every week, and I like the vamp striker thing, but, um, oh, come on. You had to love Chevalo being in there saying, like, Prince Puma. And, and with Dude, his it reminded me of Lord Alfred Hayes and how he used to fucking drive me crazy calling Cato from the Orient Express Kato. Oh, we got Kato using his martial arts skills. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. <laughs> I love. I liked it. I thought of of the guys out there that you could get to still give it a big feel. Um, you know, who else would you have gotten at the time? Ronaldo would have been the only other choice, but I think that he was too too engaged at the time with his access stuff. God damn it, Justin! I was right there in the fucking front row. I had already done my believers backlash. I was available. I could say brother. Brother. I'm not as good of an announcer as Vampiro, but let me tell you something. I would call Matt Stryker on some of the bullshit I've heard him say. Like what? It's too. We're, we make the podcast too long already, Byron. Oh, oh, look at that. No, He's talking to Paul as well. Yes. Um. Things are falling down on Casey for people who are just listening to the audio of this. And if you are just listening to the audio of this, good, because we are hideous and disfigured. You don't want to see us. You're um, missing out. I'm so, being radio. 
The the next segment after the match, I think we're done with that match, but the next segment after that is Lotus killing Dragon Azteca, which we already talked about. Um, and it, <laughs> it was... Kaga! She got him right in the back parts and then a little... And then out of there. Um, and then, you know, what Dario says, you should come with me. And she's like, no, no, I'm going here. And he's like, no, no, you just started a war, dumbass. You're coming with me now. You're on my side whether you like it or not. And so basically what about now... your brother? Dario basically just Jedi mind tricked her into killing someone and being his valet now. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, he said, "This is not the killer you're looking for." Move along. I have a question. Did he wait? Did he say it like Ringo right. Starr? Did, is that how that went down? He said it like yeah. Ringo Starr. Exactly. <laughs> I have a question. God damn it! It was Sir Alec Guinness. It's an anagram for genuine class. <laughs> They go on the they go on the run. Dario has a suit, but I'm sure he can change his stuff. You know, he has his clothes. But meanwhile, Black Lotus has to wear pretty much a leather jumper the whole time. Hey, yeah. fucking Matanza has to cram himself in a U-Haul being towed by an SUV, and you know that Matanza doesn't get bathroom breaks. He's he's pissing and shitting all over himself in there. Yeah, no, no, no. Like he's, wait, no, no. He's got astronaut diapers, dude. He could go all the way to Florida in there and be fine. All I know is I just remember the part in Ultima Lucha Dos where they had to restart the match because Pentagon literally beat the shit out of him. And then they changed it and didn't show it on TV and had Matanza go over. I don't know what the fuck happened. Editing is magic. So not what happened. So not what happened. Speaking of which, that's the Sierra Miedo... I can't speak. Sierra Miedo match is next. Um, um, Vampiro... I noticed, because I recently watched the first episode ever also, Vampiro looked really thin in the very first episode. If you haven't watched it recently, go back and just look at when they come out and they're standing up or whatever. Vampiro is like a twig. And by the time we get to Ultima Lucha 1, Vampiro is not a twig. So my question for you, Casey, is did like the knees and the back like make him swell up or what? What was going on? I know? heard they have really fucking good catering. I don't know. Uh, but I do got to say that we fucking brought it for this match. Justin, you weren't there, and I was horribly disappointed in you. But we did have Byron sure. there. We Sorry. had Jay Ray, his brother James as well. Yeah. Okay. We, have we had friend of the podcast, Zach. Yeah. Zach's awesome. Zach. Friend of the podcast. Zach. No, wait. Where did you guys make Zach sit somewhere else? Because I feel like I saw a, a, a clip of him, but he wasn't sitting with you guys. Well, he sat up by, um, or maybe it wasn't Zach. Maybe he was. He was, there. was he, no, he, he sat, sat like, with um, our friends Kevin and Javier. We ended up having to split yeah. into multiple rows because there were so many of us, and I was not not sitting in the front fucking row. Yeah, screw that. Well, yeah, I saw Jay Ray and James were sitting up higher too. Then you and Byron were the only ones in the front row, I think. But I think Zach was even further up. I think he was like three rows up. Yeah, it was his only yeah. show that he's been to. We try to get him out to more, but he's got to work weekends. You know. Oh my God, how do you go to that one show and then not want to be back every? Like I, I might, I'm mad I didn't quit my job to be there in the first place. He's scared yeah. of Mertes. You know, it it was kind of messed up because. Um, Pentagon actually came over to us and said, where's your friend Justin? I'm disappointed in him. Yeah. And I said, I apologize on his behalf, and then he broke my arm. Dude, I'm so sorry about that. I paid the medical bills, though. What do you want me to do? There's, there's no way so much I can do. I still, I still have, like, a scar and shit. Can you see that? We all get a... Hmm. We, all just... know, we all know how wrong I was for not being at this event. We all know. It was amazing. However, you probably have less, like, uh, fluorescent light dust in your lungs now. Well, yeah, let's talk about that. So this match was pretty much a brawl. It's, uh, what, what are the official rules of a Cerro Miedo match? Dude, all I know is you got to pin the guy in the ring. It's not false count anywhere. <laughs> you do have to pin him in the ring. Okay, but see, when I, when I heard it was this no fear match or zero fear match, I figured, like, the first guy who gets really scared loses. <laughs> yeah, and, um, you know, that that could have been great, like an I quit match, but you have to say, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm scared. I'm, I'm not scared of you. In which case, uh, I think Vampiro would have won because at the end, 
I was scared of Vampiro. I was looking at him like, Jesus, dude, what are you doing? I'm don't. This is frightening. Stop doing these things to yourself. <laughs> and you know, I really do got to say something to the fans that weren't there, including yourself, Justin, since you were there for this monumentous occasion. Um, there was, uh, you know, Vampiro's been on the Stone Cold podcast, and he talked about how much longer this match was in person. And yeah. I've seen a lot of people saying, "Oh shit, they need to they need to fucking put this out on DVD so that we can see the whole match unedited." No, you got the better match on TV. Trust me on that. I'm not going to go into details, but it's better edited the way that it was. Well, since I wasn't there, I'm going to supposition and guess that a, a lot of the length of the match was probably just due to Vampiro walking slowly from place to place because the guy is not exactly super spry these days. Especially well, after getting hit with light tubes. Okay, I'll thing. say a little bit. Yeah. Let's just say the table huh. set up was not shown on TV and it caught on fire and went out and had to get set on fire again. Let's, let's just say that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we'll leave it at that then. Also, Pentag they cut out 20 minutes of Pentagon hitting Vampiro with a chair. Yeah, that was actually much shorter on television. And it took a long time for the ambulance to be able to get inside the arena to get Vampiro as well. It was long enough to where, at, when it was live, it felt like that was the end of the match. Yeah, like yeah. that false finish fooled the fuck out of us. Like, we thought that was it. And so, but this this match was right before the intermission, right? Yeah, because they had to completely they completely changed the ring map because there was so much blood and ash and glass and tacks. And let me tell you, thumbtacks fucking bounce because <laughs> they almost got to us on that superplex spot because Vampiro's a big dude to get fucking superplexed off the top rope onto a bunch of thumbtacks, so that shit bounced. Yeah, that's that sucks. Well. <laughs> It was definitely, this was the match that kind of set the bar violence-wise for Lucha Underground of like, yeah. hey, this is how much violence you can expect on a super-duper violent day at the temple. Like, this isn't a medium yeah. level. We're saying it's a high level. But yeah, the threshold's right about here. Some thumbtacks, light tubes. I mean, dude, I've been to a lot of ECW and uh, watched some of the CZW and XPW out here and like... I've been in a lot of crazy, crazy matches, but this seems like it was pretty, pretty far up there. This is when um, they were licking their own blood, too, which, you know, is kind of gross. Nah. I don't think there's any kinda to it. It's it's gross. What's gross is sucking the blood out of a guy's head and spitting it out, which Vampiro did during that match, and Mil Muertes did too. Yeah, That's kind of fucked up. Fred Blassie know. invented that because classy Freddie Blassie used to be vampire Fred Blassie. He used to file his teeth down. This is like legendary California shit. And he would bite people's heads and he'd suck the blood out and spit it. And there's like all these stories that he gave old ladies heart attacks and they died from watching him on TV and shit. And uh, they made him a muzzle like fucking Mankind or Hannibal Lecter and he had to wear that during the match. It was fucking great. But you can't unfile your teeth. It's not how you can these days. You get caps. You can get veneers. I got veneers. So that was your old gimmick too. My teeth underneath these are filed down. I look like that guy in Game of Thrones who's in the back of the wagon biting people. And oh wait, am I spoiling Fucking this thing for spoilers. you? Again? I haven't seen it. Well, catch up. How many years do I have to wait for you to catch up? I'm All you gotta do is say your your real teeth are like the kid on fucking Stranger Things. He would get that, and it wouldn't spoil anything. Yeah, that's true. They yeah. are. They're just like that. I haven't seen the last episode. Oh, well, you know his teeth are off. <laughs> yeah, that's episode. You know that. All right. Well, okay, so then there's the big reveal. This was the big uh, season one shocker. This is the thing that proved that Lucha Underground, writing-wise, could pull off a big shocker. Did... I didn't see it coming. I thought it was possible. Like I thought maybe, but then when they announced that these two guys were in a match together, I was like, "Oh, well, no. The the maestro is going to be somewhere, someone else." Um, did you guys see this swerve coming and this little turnaround with Vampiro being Pentagon's master? I, I was did, but people that went to tapings earlier did. Wait, say that again, Casey. When I think we were cutting out. Uh, I didn't think that that was the case, but people that went to tapings earlier did because there was a segment that never aired that was edited out of shows. 
the Pentagon directly asked Vampiro to be his maestro. And Interesting. We, I started going to tapings after that, so I never saw that part. Uh, so some people might have had the idea that they were still going in that direction. Um, but I didn't find out about that until much later because I never read any spoilers for the season. I didn't want to know what was going on. Smart. I mean, it's more entertaining if you don't. I mean, like, I think one time during season two... Uh, oh, yeah, I think when I went... Because I didn't go to the very first tapings of season two. I went the very next week. So I think I read spoilers for the first week because everybody else who was there the second week already knew what was going on. <laughs> Once we were going to shows, we were reading spoilers like crazy to laugh at how fucking wrong they were. Oh, yeah, and they were so off. Yeah. Even those ones that I read for that when I went to the second week and I was there and I was like, oh, did this and this and this happen? Are we going to see something from that? And everyone was like, nope. That didn't and we happen. fucking message each other and go, oh, Meltzer thinks that Cobra Moon's cheerleader Melissa. What a fucking moron. You know? <laughs> I think they still call Drago Dragon. Oh. Oh. So bad. Like, yeah. they just need to get over it. It's like, dude, that you can get the spoilers, and it, but it doesn't matter. It's a TV show, man. It's like if someone gives me spoilers from the, the set of, you know, The Flash that's taping right now. It's going to be totally out of context. Whatever, you know, okay, yeah, now I know that there's a big oil rig truck chase in episode yep. four of the next season of The Flash. It doesn't matter. It's a TV show. Like, what is the spoiler going to do for you? It's like and only that's... finding out about the stunts before you watch the movie. Yeah. Why, I mean, why does it look like you're holding a pregnancy test? Is it positive? What does one line mean? <laughs> it means it's Casey's. Fuck. It always means it's Casey's. Is it hey, Byron, I want to show you around at this place above a bunch of stairs. <laughs> That's horrible. That's horrible. There's much easier ways to deal with that. Go on, um, Mister. Hey, Byron, well, we let's, let's get you drunk about Melissa. <laughs> Terrible. Hey, don't steal, don't steal gimmicks from other people. Oh, oh shit, that's right. Wait, so you didn't see it coming, but other people had. What about you, Byron? Did you what, did you have any clue that the swerve was coming? And what did you think of the the swerve? I, it's not even really a swerve. I guess it's just a, a, a the twist. I thought it was awesome. I didn't really see it coming. Uh, my main concern was that I didn't really know where Vampiro was uh, in, with his involvement with Dutra Underground, so I was concerned that he was him and Conan were the biggest stars of season one, and I was concerned that Vampiro was going to put himself over, and he did it. No. He put Pentagon over, and he took him under his wing to make him a bigger star, which is awesome. Vampiro is the man. I gotta what? tell you, Byron, what? history is on your side there in thinking that Vampiro would put himself over because that exact thing happened. It might not have been Vampiro putting himself over. It might have been AAA doing it. But there was a whole feud with Chessman in AAA that kind of mirrored the Pentagon feud a little bit. And then Vampiro's the one who ended up winning the feud and then just leaving. It just took off, bolted. Which is why I wanted to make the signs because I wanted to show that if Pentagon lost, that we were still on his side. That's the whole reason I, I had fucking professional animators making signs and coming to the show with us to show their shit. Oh, and good. So, so you're, you were all, you've already been comfortable for a year or more now with the idea of Pentagon losing in an Ultima Lucha. That's good. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. I'm just saying. You guys want to see me fucking cry on camera? Is that what's happening? Yeah. Yes. I know, but that's part of why we're talking about this episode in our first episode back since you had to relive the trauma of that. Like, folks, we haven't been, we haven't done an episode since we had Casey almost in tears talking about Pentagon losing at Ultima Lucha Dos. He just Every time I close my eyes, I see that fucking three count. <laughs> no, it was funny, though. At Ultima Lucha uh, Uno, we tweeted a picture of all of us with our Pentagon signs at Vampiro telling him he's going to lose or something. And he replied, going like, "It was six six people, so scary." <laughs> yeah, I fucking love Vamp Hero, man. He's awesome. <laughs> Vamp is great. Um, so the gift of the gods match. I'm not going to talk too much about this. Uh, Big dive. Aerostar, awesome. Love yeah. It. Oh, and Big Rick almost fucking killed Sexy Star. Oh my God, that was a choke slam or whatever through the ring. Yeah, yeah. or something. Uh, they had to carry her out. I heard she got a stinger. Who wouldn't? Picks her up and 
Somebody yes, four yes. times her size would have not survived that bump. That was a really, really like. Why did he do that? I don't remember if it was a choke slam or if it was that fucking book of Ezekiel that he did. It's his finish, which is it's yeah. sort of like a bookend or something. Yeah, it's yeah. like a rock bottom, but you sit out, right? No, no, no. You stand. That's why he planted. Well, he was he was standing. I mean, he threw her down like four four feet. It's like <laughs> a one choke fucking slam. arm. He basically almost put her through the mat. It is like a choke slam, but the way, but with the rock bottom setup, right? Mm -hmm. And the way that happens is you don't really brace the back and flatten them out, and you drop women on their heads. Well, yeah, he he over torqued it a little bit, so she went back. Um, but it was crazy because if you watch the spot, he's not jumping up and down at all. And the whole mat from her light little frame, and she can't weigh but maybe a buck ten, the whole thing compresses and then bounces her up in the air, and it's just like, holy shit, that cannot possibly have been the way that that was supposed to go down. No, and then um, them carrying her out, uh, I don't know if that made TV or not. I don't remember. I don't think it did. I'm, I just I had it on in the background yesterday, but... That shit was legit, though. They legit carried her out. And, and you know, honestly, thank God that was dead center in the middle of the ring with the most give. Yeah. Because if that had been even a, a foot or more closer to the apron, that could have been really bad news. Yeah. But uh, it looked crazy on TV. Mm-hmm. So I did know. Aerostar's dive, which I swear when it happened, it was like it was happening in slow motion in person. Did you feel that way, Byron? Well, we knew we we saw him disappear, and then we saw him sort of climbing up there. And and Aerostar has been one of your favorite luchadors for a long time, and you know his history of trying to fall from the highest spot in a building. And he but, found a new spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he just he just picks random spots. Like, hey, I think I'm gonna dive off of this now. I think and honestly, we, I've seen him jump off a of higher shit in Mexico because he'll just straight up dive off of the lighting rigs and shit. Well, we saw. We I think we were curious as to what he was going to do because then Helico was taking all those big dives. Right. Well, this brings me back to the twenty five secrets of Lucha Underground guy or whatever. It's like yeah. all the talk about Angelico, but geez, look at this dive. I mean, Arrow starts nuts. Yeah, he had like four guys catching him when uh, probably should have had all six guys catching him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he he messed his ankle up, I think. He gets hurt a lot because um, he does crazy shit. So what do you expect? And people don't always catch him because sometimes he's moving too fast to catch, really. And it's like, plus, when someone's falling from that high, do you really want to be the guy taking the whole hit from it? You want to kind of disperse it a little bit, and then some people are alligator arming it? You never know. Yeah. Hey, what? how did Cuerno finish in this match? I don't even really remember. I think I he, he got killed on the dive, maybe? Yeah, so he was just just out on the side, not really doing anything. Yeah, because we all thought he was he was uh, gonna win. going over in that one instead of Phoenix. I think he was busy beating up kill shot somewhere. Oh yeah, because they were still doing that thing. No, that was already over by then. Killshot had already done his jobs for the season. Killshot was was free and clear of job status by then. Sons of bitches. <laughs> no, wait, did Phoenix pinned Cuerno to win to keep their film? Ah, fuck, I don't remember, man. I should have watched this. Well, again. no, the, the, the Gift of the Gods ends. Uh, Phoenix goes over on Jack after the fire driver. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. And Jack shines in this match, man. I mean, like, considering he wasn't doing a lot of his normal antics, like, the whole finish of the match basically turns into a one-on-one -on -one with Phoenix and Jack. And it's just, it's solid, straight-up wrestling clean finish, like, but Jack is great, as always. I mean, Jack's yeah. selling stuff, even when he's not doing his his brand of flippy shit. Um, and this was honestly one of the moments, too, where I was like, God, they need to get Jack in an angle and push him and get him out of this, you know, weird mid-card seven-man match status, because he's clearly got more gas in the tank than all these other dudes out here, except for probably Phoenix oh. and Aerostar. You know, like, he could be running a match in a different way. So this was kind of the start of that, I think, for Jack getting elevated to the at least the top of the middle of the card. I just remember when Jack debuted, he was walking to the ring on his hands, and it was awesome. Doing the leg switch thing where he's, like, while he's on his hands. Crazy. 
Like, I've seen him do that shit on a fucking skateboard. Handstand to the ring on a skateboard. <laughs> Jack's freaking amazing. Oh, we hate you, Jack. Hate Ooh. You. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Bad. Bad Jack. We'd have hair like Byron. Way to copy my gimmick. Um, he can my gimmick with his handstands, too. I could do that. Well, so was th this next match, was this even a match? Tejano versus Blue Demon? I, I don't remember that one. I think I went to go to the bathroom and get popcorn or something. Was there oh. even... I don't even... I remember the weird finish with uh, the, the, the crew and Chavo beat down and Chavo and Blue Demon are now friends and Tejano's like sitting in the corner like, who booked this shit? What is this? <laughs> what happened was Chavo was running an angle with, I think, Tejano over who was Mexico, even though they're both Chavo is American and Tejano is named Texas. Mm -hmm. But and Chavo uh, got hurt. Chavo busted his hamstring, and so they brought in Blue Demon Jr., who just sucks. And so this was the only match we sat down for. It was boring. I don't even... I don't like oh, angry Blue about Demon it. Jr. did some great shit talking to the fans. <laughs> uh, it didn't make TV. <laughs> where he was, he was fucking talking about how he's from Miami and how everyone just is sitting around eating tortillas and shit. It was pretty fucked up. No, so this was supposed to be a heel turn for him, basically, yeah. right? But he was already against Tejano, and it was like. I don't know. I just, like, the whole gimmick, I get that they were tying up the first, very first match from Lucha Underground ever, which was Blue Demon versus Chavo. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, they're coming together, and I, I kind of got where it was going, but this, to me, it felt like this match was booked when they filmed season the first match. Like, and they just left it. Like, this was always the plan, so they just did it, even though in the grand world of Lucha Underground, by the time they got to this, it was so lame compared to everything else that was going on. Can I just say, like, when we were at ringside, we weren't sti we weren't sitting for the whole fucking show, basically. Right. And that match, everyone sat down. It it's mean to say, but it's true. Well, that tells you something. I mean, and and I love Chavo too. And he is like the agent stuff he's done, and the, some of the work, and some of the angles that he's he's done, but. I do feel like this was maybe a little bit of Chavo putting himself over this whole angle and trying to trying to be the representative of what's great about wrestling in Mexico, but at the same time, I feel like they were missing the mark with this angle the whole season. It wasn't even just this match. I feel like this angle was well, something I that... I was excited about the very beginning when I first started watching Lucha Underground. Like, yeah, this is going to be the tradition angle that gives some of the real Mexican wrestling fire to this show. But at the same time, mm -hmm. I feel like it fizzled pretty early on. Well, the whole Mexico thing ties into Dragon Azteca and Lotus and Dario and all of that. But I think what threw this off was they were going to have Chavo, who's a prob I, Chavo's a better worker than um, and more relevant to our crowd, then Blue Demon Jr., he was going to wrestle, and then they had to heel turn Blue Demon Jr. for no reason, just to put him in that position. But it sucked, and then they had just... It's an ODQ match, and so your buddies come in, and they helped... The crew helped him win, but you're like, why are they with Blue Demon Jr.? Why is the crew helping him? It's, it all was a bunch of garbage. And also, like, I don't think we really knew who Tejano was at the time. I do gotta say, props to Blue Demon Jr. for agreeing to it, because usually people of his stature would not agree to a heel turn like that. Well, yeah, about I thought I felt it was out of place, but I feel like they were they were counting on that heel turn meaning something too mm -hmm. much because you got to it, and especially after we, you know, you, you've seen the the Maestro thing with Vampiro already, and it's like this heel turn does nothing now. Like maybe maybe that's the problem. Maybe putting it after the Vampiro thing was a mistake. It's just, there was a lot of swerves, and then Chavo came out, he came out, right, with, with the crutches, yeah. and then he turned on Tejano. The thing is, Chavo turned face after the match to the live crowd, apologizing, because that was the big main event for the live crowd, for the taping. Um, the big main event was, like, this this big match with Chavo for the title or something, and he yeah, bucked, 
Yeah, and but then he busts his hamstring early on, and the crew comes in to schmoz the you know to bump for Puma so we could see him do some stuff. And he came out afterwards on crutches and apologized for not being able to give us the main event. You know, they fixed it for the show, but for the live crowd, we were concerned for Chavo. And then he came out and did something honorable. So for us, Chavo sort of face turned, right? And so right. he comes out playing upon that, like he's face turning to help out Tejano. And then he turns on him. And then, but on TV, he was always with the crew. Right. And you just didn't know that. See, and that's weird because I feel like maybe they wrote some of that just to get an emotional response out of the crowd. But again, I think this is something that in season two, clearly Lucha Underground figured out how to do better versions of this and get the same kind of, to get the actual result that they were looking for. I feel like this was one of the very, very rare misses in season one that they just, this is where it added up to. And they were just like, you know what, let's do it, let's get done with it, and we'll just do it better next time. Which yeah. they have, and more power to them. You can't do everything right the first time. Travel with all of this stuff in Season 2 is amazing. Um, and so yeah. then the, the last match, uh, obviously, to talk about here is Prince Puma versus Mil Muertes. Um, and this match, when you watch it now, it's amazing to watch because these guys have such completely different styles. Completely. Yeah. But as the match progresses, you start seeing them work each other's styles. Like, I don't know how much these guys have wrestled each other before this match, um, but it felt like there was a feeling out process and they worked their way through the crowd and they went everywhere in the building, which a lot of these matches did. I personally they have loved never that. had a match before this. Right, so, th I mean, and you can see them feeling each other out, but by the end, it's crazy. You got Puma hoisting Mill up on his shoulders, yeah. doing, like, these the, the insiguri drop to Mill Muertes, and he's, like, 100 pounds heavier than Puma. It's crazy. Yeah. And, and like, they're working the style, and they just start flowing at the end of this thing. Blew my mind. Blew my mind for two completely different styles. Go ahead, you know, Mark. What blew my mind is them wrapping uh, my friend Javier's sign around Mil Muertes' head. He still has that sign, by the way. Yeah, he yeah. That as a souvenir. That was awesome. But remember, we warned Zach. We said, when Mill looks at you and makes the parting hand motion, move. And I did beat himself a little bit when that happened. Like, I, I think maybe in the back of his head he thought, Mil Muertes is really going to come at us and get right at us. <laughs> Wrong. Why is it so dark, Casey? Because it's nighttime. Why is it so bright there? Isn't it like fucking midnight? I'm in a hotel room. Hmm. I'm. It's nice of you to rent a hotel room just to do the show. We appreciate that. Yeah, Welcome I'm in back. a much darker place, Byron. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm talking to Casey Dark right now. <laughs> I have to say, I was not thinking that Mill was going to go over in this match. Um, I thought booking-wise it made too much sense for Mill to go over in this match, so I didn't think they were going to do it, so I kind of like double-swerved myself, <laughs> I think. He went um, over, and he went over big time. They they used a fucking lens shake in post on the flatliner. Yeah, to make it more brutal, the top row fucking flatliner. Well, he I, I'm going to say Mill looked a little gassed by the time they got there because the like the five spots right before that were ridiculous. Um and what then they do they did like a table spear where they but they pretty much missed the table, just caught the corner of it and the legs didn't even break like it just fell yeah. down. So then he slams them into the table again or something. I mean, and then Puma does a 6.30 that Mill kicks out of, and then Mill's doing slams that Puma's kicking out of. Like, dude, these guys were full go at the end of this match. It was yeah. crazy. And this is not a short match. I mean, on TV, this thing was a half an hour, so I gotta imagine it was probably 40 minutes live. Yeah, it seemed pretty long. But was... in a good way. Not, like, boring, but cool shit happening the whole time. No, it was well set up. I mean, they worked all the way around the audience before they even really get in the ring, before the match even really starts. There's like seven or eight minutes on TV of these guys just working through the whole crowd. There's not even really a real spot until I think there's one back spot up in the bleachers up by Zach, by the way, which is where I think I saw that he was sitting nowhere close to everyone else. 
Like he got, I think Zach got pushed further and further to the back the whole time he was there. I think by the end he was like in the last row. Yeah. He should have crowd surfed. We would have got him. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just really impressed. And like, you know, if you haven't seen this match and you go back and watch it, don't expect the uh, the King Ricochet flippy shit kind of match. It's not that. He does do some crazy spots, but the more impressive spots are, are the fact that he like he does a couple of big slams and hoist spots on Mill in this match that are not common for Puma with guys that big. Uh -huh. Is this a match where Puma gets powerbombed under the ring steps, too? Yeah. But yeah. he did, like, a back backflip somersaulty thing into a Pele kick. That was kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, and honestly, it may have happened one time earlier in the season, but this is one of the first times I've seen somebody use the, the, the ring stairs in Lucha. Mill actually picks them up, and you can see they're solid wood. They're not, like, the hollowed out... Uh, diamond plate that the WWE uses that's in two pieces, so it's nice and light to pick up. And then uh -huh. other places have the same thing, but it's in one piece. This is like something that a prop house built out of solid, you know, Home Depot two by four kind of shit. And like you, when he picks it up, you're looking at it like, dang, that is not a prop that is meant to be used as a weapon in wrestling. That was like that was like one spot that we didn't even react. We just looked at each other and go, that's fucked up. It was. It was a tremendous spot. I was, uh, I don't know, something about this match, and this was the match where Mill was over to me a little bit before this, but at the same time, this was the match where it was like, good, I hope he does win. And there was already rumors about Puma starting even back then, but, um, you know, back then I just dismissed it outright. of, oh, he's not going anywhere. He's been the champ all year at Lucha Underground. And I honestly thought that um, marketing-wise, they would leave the belt on the baby face during the time off. I really didn't see going into this match somehow Mill winning. I just thought, you know, they got to put it on Puma, whether they leave it on Puma, whether they want to or not. I thought it was awesome how the the show ends with the fucking disciples of death coming out with yeah. Mill, and then evil reigning supreme, and then we get the cool you know vignette thing at the end with everyone taken off from the temple, where we first get to see that little tiny glimpse of Matanza. I mean, and who did they even know they were getting a season two officially then? No. Who is with the, all the bad guys wearing the gold and they don't even know for sure that they're going to have another season? I think they knew. They just they didn't know how they were going to figure it out yet. They, had, they were optimistic, but, you know, they could have worried a little bit that it wasn't happening. I think that it's been on record that they were a little worried that it might not happen. Yeah. Well, it was part of the issue that they didn't know if they could keep the the set because they had built the whole set, but they were renting it at the time, right? And they're still yeah. renting it, aren't they? Well, yeah, they got they, they tore the whole thing down after the season ended, and that was a discussion that maybe to get season two they would have to shoot somewhere else and it would be cheaper, and that's why everyone's leaving the temple at the end of the show. Like, uh, and Dario's even on the run. Yeah, and, but uh, what was it? Um. I and think it's like, oh fuck! Now we got to explain Dario coming back. Yeah, well, they they re they got renewed. I think the network said they wanted the show back, but the show needed to find money from a legit source to pay for it. Like they got some sort of bailout funding in season one, and then they figured out figured out how to cut some costs and I think find something else. But they lost um, distribution in Mexico, which is a big deal. Yeah, that's messed up. But I will say this. They have a Pentagon t-shirt now, so I'm pretty sure the money will be fine for the rest of time. Yes. Order. <laughs> buy the shirt. Oh, like any, like you even need to tell anybody. that, uh, Dude, I think the Pentagon shirt will eclipse the Bullet Club shirt sales probably by the end of next week. Yeah, all we got to do is get all the fucking neckbeards on board with Pentagon like they are with the Bullet Club. Dude, okay, so here's the deal. Next week, all three of us, Silver Lake... We're going to go into some, like, tiki bar in Silver Lake wearing Pentagon shirts, and that will solve the whole thing. Like, everybody in the world will have a Pentagon shirt in, like, a week. Like, we just have to go hipsters on parade with our Pentagon shirts on. Oh, hipsters, gross. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Yeah, so that, that imagery of Katrina standing there with all the gold, and that was when I was like, okay, Katrina's on another level. She threw the beat down on Evie. She's got the tag champs or the trios champs and she's got the heavyweight champ 
Yeah. Uh, Phoenix is the only wild card in the mix, and I just figured that we'll come back to season two, and Phoenix will just get squashed like a bug, and that'll be that. Hey, hey, he's the one guy that's been proven to be able to stop Milwaukee. Yeah. Come on, it's like the ultimate like cliffhanger with the ending. You're like, this guy just destroyed Puma. Like, this whole Mil Muertes and his dudes are the most unstoppable forces, but Phoenix. Well, and, and, and that elevated Phoenix even more right there of, like, look, this yeah. is the one guy you can count on. Uh, Pentagon's off doing his little weirdness with Vampiro, so you're not really thinking about him being in that mix yet. And of course, Casey was. Um, yes. <laughs> but Which I kind of was, too. I was like, ooh, this is going to set up big stuff for... For Pentagon, he's going to be in the hunt, and he'll probably get the belt at the next Ultima Lucha. That didn't happen. Oh. Just saying. There's reasons to cry. I can't believe you still watch this show, Casey. I, I like How bad could they have possibly broken your... I, I'll leave it alone. I'll leave it alone. God um, so damn it, Justin. We have the, <laughs> Talk about MMA. How about that? We'll get there. We'll get there very soon. Um, when does CM Punk fight? Uh, soon. He fights in Cleveland, my hometown. He's on the, uh, the Steep Amy Ochich card to fight Mickey Gall in Cleveland in uh, a month. I can't wait. Can't wait so, um, yeah, we got the Connor fight before that. Oh, so basically, yeah, we get the, the segment that Casey keeps talking about, about everyone leaving. Dario, uh, the big thing with Dario leaving is that he takes his bull with him, which is amazing. Love that he doubles back for the, the bull. Um, Phoenix in the Gold Firebird was the second most amazing thing in the closing <laughs> segment because that car is just rad. Now, here's a question I have for you. I don't know if you remember this or not, Casey, because I don't think you watched this again recently as I have. That's Cuerno in the truck that's following Phoenix? Yes, 100%. At first I thought Cuerno. it was Tejano because I think the first time I saw it, I watched it on a much smaller TV, and then I had it on the big TV uh, this time, though, I've seen it a bunch of times. I'm just not really paying attention, I think. Yeah, it, it's definitely Cuerno. He's wearing the cowboy hat that's been established as his street gear. <laughs> that's right. Because actually, when they designed the characters, they designed three looks for each of them. So they designed their entrance gear, their wrestling gear, and their street clothes. So Mil Muertes, when he wears that suit, that, that pimpin'-ass suit that he wears, that yeah. was actually designed by the clothing designers. Puma's hoodie is... And um, Cuerno's cowboy outfit is. Well, I feel like the hoodie is that whole clan's uh, street attire. It's like they're, they're street ninja clothes. <laughs> I'm sure that the ancient Aztecs wore hoodies as well. <laughs> yeah, probably. They, they should like do that. They should do a big flashback segment where they're all wearing, like, you know, monk hoods or something that look just like the hoodies. That would be hilarious. Made out of jaguar skins and shit. Um. Okay, so this is where we're also introduced to the fact that Marty kidnapped Sexy, right? She's all tied up, and we know yeah. that, that we're getting the Marty Sexy thing. And that was the other one where it was just like, it was in the middle of the package. And I was like, wait, hold on. What the fuck? Rewind? Why does Marty have Sexy Star tied up in, like, rope, Japanese porn style? Like, what is going on here? You know... Shit's rough in the temple. What can I say? Marty's, he was Marty's gonna take her out of wrestle. Marty's tired of being overlooked, and he's making moves. I Maybe mean, but he just wanted to teach the girl how to do a fucking wrestling move for once in her life. And uh, I don't yeah, know. But you, I don't know how you, okay, you not them. being the biggest sexy star fan, you had to be loving this. Of like, they found a better use for her. That like she's gonna be in some like soap opera e drama angle, oh. right? I was hoping she would never get out, and they would just ignore her for the rest of the season. Yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's... Well, what I, I like this, because if you go back, and like I said, I've recently watched some of the early episodes also, you know, they're just telling you in exposition, or Stryker is telling you, for the most part, um, of her backstory of how she's this heroic whatever, and it's like, yeah, don't tell me that. Show it to me. And that was clearly what they did here of like why have this backstory this wrestling backstory of just telling people that she's this heroine let's actually do it and at writing wise whatever you think about her wrestling wise I have to say writing wise that was a huge choice and to do it this way and this visually was smart and to have it go like this this season gap thing was so perfect for this because 
it's a very touchy storyline, and they don't want to look like they're being pussies in Lucha Underground by not tackling it head-on, but you can have this time lapse in the middle here that you don't have to explain every little detail of it as, like you would if it was a weekly show. If this was Raw, you'd have to show, okay, what happens to her in Marty's lair next week. Instead, she's kidnapped, she's tied up, and then we can jump right to the craziness of how she's getting out of it without saying what happened while she was tied up. I just thought I just think it's brilliant and the way that they did it here where they just throw you that segment and Marty creepy as hell. This was a guy that not ten or twelve episodes before this, you're like, this guy's going, you know, this character's going nowhere. He was right? just a nerd. Even though Sexy Star went over in that program it, it, that program made Marty, I think. Absolutely. It was great. It was good great stuff. Um I refuse to count any sexy star wins as actually happening, so I don't think that um, she went over in that feud. Uh, but that's okay. Um, what were the other segments? Oh, Havoc, the Team Havoc motorcycle thing where uh, Son of Havoc has to ride bitch with Evilies. That's just funny. Uh, I would do that, though, man. I wouldn't mind. Oh, that's the that's the best seat in the house. Are you kidding me? Let's, let's go hit the open room again. Put the old feet in the basket. Um... Is she a great big fat person? Is she a great big fat person? Would you fuck one. me? I'd fuck you. Pentagon Pentagon segment was the where are we going and Vamp gets to give us his now famous a much darker place quote for the first time. It always bugged his book titles because his voice distortion, I cannot understand anything Vampiro says with the, with the maestro voice. I, I love the maestro voice. Really? Yeah, I have a hard time understanding it on my TV. I don't know. Get a, get a decent TV. Go Wear fuck headphones. yourself. I see. I, I listen to stuff in headphones all the time. You guys aren't even wearing them now. I'm wearing headphones because I like. I got them. headphones up. I don't want to. I wore headphones today. Well, I know. I like things to always be inside my brain. It's the TV production thing. I walk around with a walkie in one ear, an IFB in the other ear, and then headphones on top of it with the video feedback like all the time. I will listen to three things at once. I love having headphones on. I don't like that. I'm nuts. Um, but yeah, but I also started off as an audio guy. You, you're one of those video people. Um, what about the image? Let's see. Dragon Azteca takes the mask. Takes or Dragon Azteca Junior takes the mask in this final thing, and it looks like it was actually Ray Horace then. Yeah, it was. It was, and I called it, and no one believed it was that I was right. And I said that looks like Ray Horace's fucking chin right there. And then when he started wrestling, it was Ray Horace who was right. Casey, never fucking doubt El Dandy again, people. <laughs> well, I'm just surprised that, like, literally they brought him in for a 20-second spot to set him up for Season 2. That's amazing to me. Or maybe they taped that vignette so much later that it was really close to Season 2 taping time. But then he tags the sign. I was pissed. When I first saw this, I was pissed, and I was hoping that that was, like, an overlay or some bullshit. And then I, I remember asking Casey or Byron, one of you guys, I was like, did they really tag the freaking thing? And you guys are like, yeah, it's tagged. And I was like, what the F? Ray Mysterio. Well, I know. And we, we had known, we had thought Ray was going to come in the weekend of the, the Drago return, um, but that was the weekend right after the Peril thing happened, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah, that wasn't gonna happen. I don't even know if it was gonna happen then anyway. Like I don't know if he was gonna be coming until season two anyway. Right. But it, I mean that whole situation was so weird and you know, it's such a tragic fucking thing that happened. That yeah, and I mean nobody would have faulted Ray if he'd walked away altogether. Right. And you know, I I have nothing but respect for Ray Mysterio. He's one of my favorite wrestlers. I think he's one of the greatest luchadors of all time, like, without question. And anyone that disagrees is probably just a punk-ass bitch that's only seen his WWE work, and they can go fuck themselves. Yeah, and look, that whole situation was so random on, on a level of cosmically awful randomness that yeah. can't ever be explained. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't like some, you know preventable accident thing, you know, that it wasn't like the Owen thing. It wasn't like some of these other tragic situations. It was just so, so, so random. But I remember at the time there were a lot of rumors that Ray was already coming in. Right. So when the question mark went up, a lot of people were, that was their first, like, oh, Ray is coming thing, and they were all happy about it. I was just pissed because I love the billboard and the question mark 
ruined it for me. And oh. it's still up there, right? Yeah. It's still on the sign. They never changed it. And which is so weird because they always use the stock helicopter footage from the beginning of the first season, even into season two after the question mark's up there. They use the cutaways with the billboard without the question mark all the time. It's like the biggest regular continuity error in Lucha Underground, I think. Anyway, so that's it. That's our that's our look back at Ultima Lucha 1. Um, Great show. I got to talk WWE. I don't normally do this and... and Casey, I know, bear with me here. I have to say this. I have to give props to WWE right now. Their product is back where it should be. I did not think this brand split was going to work. I thought it was garbage. I thought that Raw was going to feel super flat without the, the, the amount of people on the roster. But instead, they've actually done the right thing. I feel like WWE listened to a lot of the WrestleMania backlash that they got from their fans, and instead of trying to hot shot to fix some of the things immediately, they took their time. They came up with this because they had business opportunities, obviously, that led to this. You know, advertisers drive everything here. But I feel like whether people know it or not, WWE is actually addressing a lot of the concerns about their product. Minus one giant concern that they can't address, or that they, they, most people involved at the top would be unwilling to address, which is the fact that Raw is still too long. Um, even this week, the, the middle hour was a lot of filler, but the first hour and the last hour are the best that WWE's been in a long time. And just talking like a consistent weekly show level, um, since the last pay-per-view was great. Um, even even since Money in the Bank. Money in the Bank pay-per-view wasn't even bad. I watched it and I wasn't angry. Even with the, the swerve finish at the end. Um, you know, but Byron, what are your thoughts? Actually, I'm going to start with Casey because no. I just... Cause no. Casey's not going to take a long time. That's why I'm going to start with Casey. Casey, what are your thoughts on the current WWE product? Have you even watched any of it recently? Uh, no, and um, when you say that everything's the way it should be, I I assume you mean Undertaker's the champion now, but I know that didn't fucking happen. <laughs> Undertaker's not even on these shows, and I think that you saying that they have to stretch to fill time is exactly what I said would happen when they're splitting up the roster and they have even less guys to stretch to fill the time. Yeah, but the thing that they are doing that works is... The people who are there are getting storylines that matter to fill up a lot of the time, too. The first hour segments, which used to be the thing that would really, really make me fucking ah, gag, those that are supposed to feel big, they actually feel big again. I actually want to see Finn Balor come to the ring and cut a promo. I actually want to see Mick Foley swerve somebody into a match. Um, I'm, I'm liking the stuff that they're doing, and even on SmackDown, the promo with uh, John Cena this week was amazing, where Cena came out and was just like getting cheers and boos, and at the same time, he just threw down the gauntlet of like, look, I love this business, I have a passion for it. He cut like a real heartfelt fucking promo. He does that every month. Uh, this one felt different to me. Uh, he, it, did, he did against Daniel Bryan, he did against CM Punk, no, no. And, and I'm not saying, I'm, and those were good too. But I'm saying you're they're bringing back some of that. And honestly, in the last year, they've been so far below even that level. I'm not saying it's an A plus product right now. I'm saying that it's at least back to the the at least B plus product that it has been in the last you know five six years. Well, their, their camera angles, uh, the way they shoot the show has improved dramatically. Uh, like It was noticeable at the last pay-per-view. They tell the story more by yeah. the production. They're doing the close-ups on the faces. They told the story of Xavier and Bray Wyatt, in that, and that stood out to me, but then Raw came on, and it wasn't just a one-match, one-storyline thing. They were doing that the whole show. And then also, um, everything is breathing more. They're telling stories and letting the segments happen at a much better pace so that way they breathe more. You, you, it soaks in a little bit. 
beforehand, everything was rushing. You'd have like an entrance match, quick match, just roll up and it's over. You now, know? so my, here's a question for you: How do you feel about Sasha going over as the women's champ now? Now, some people said that the impact wasn't quite there the way it should have been if they had done it when everybody wanted it to. But look, you're a wrestling fan. They're not going to always give it to you when you want it. Part of the whole thing is the money's in the chase for a, a character like Sasha. And eventually we all knew that they had to put it on her. But was this the right time? I, I thought it felt good. I thought it felt good. I think the whole like changeover, this is the new, new. So then it's a great thing for Sasha to to uh, define, but I think the WrestleMania entrance, I think what they did for Sasha, they did a year too early. The way they had Snoop bring her down to the ring, screamed, this is her night. It wasn't her night, and Charlotte needed more time with the belt. She needed more time to establish herself as, you know, who she well, was. And, and Jericho called her out on that this week. It was hilarious. I mean, they, they pointed... <laughs> That whole segment, I thought, pointed to all the flaws. It was WWE being self-referential through the through his voice, um, and they even made fun of of how the Charlotte angle played out and everything. Like, you know, I I love the whole thing and Enzo being in there and whatever. I thought it was great. It was a great segment. I don't. I didn't watch. Was it Raw? I didn't yeah. watch SmackDown this week, and I forgot that SmackDown was on Tuesdays this oh, week. Oh my God! Did you? So you you've actually you you're the first guy you're the one that can't remember that they moved the show by two days. Oh, I thought it was still on Friday. What is today Wednesday? Wait, no, today's Thursday. They moved by three days. Whatever. What day is today? Yeah. Anyways, uh, I I thought riveting podcast. I missed I missed SmackDown completely because I thought it was back to Friday, and then but see I love Dean Ambrose. But I'm all, I'm kind of put down because Dean Ambrose is now the secondary title holder, but he's still he's going to be the primary holder because the universal belt sucks. By the way, here's a scoop that you wouldn't know if unless you have the internet. The new title is going to be the same uh, logo title, except they're going to have the swooshes or something. It's going to be red and blue. Interesting. Which is weird because right now you have the red one on SmackDown. And the pink one on the women. They're going to do the same thing with the women's belt. That'll be interesting. Yeah, you know, right now, um, if you're a woman and you're on SmackDown, you have to be asking yourself who exactly you pissed off in life and why yeah. your karma is so bad. Because there's no belt there currently. Whether they make one or not, it's fine. They got to get a belt on SmackDown. Becky Lynch needs to hope and pray that there's a belt on SmackDown before Bailey gets promoted to the show, or else she's never going to win it. Well, I mean, but. Oh, no, that belt's going on Eva Marie, dude. Come on. <laughs> Eva Marie just walks around like a. Wait, isn't Nia Jax on that show? Doesn't she get the belt? No, she's raw. Yeah, she's oh, raw. She's raw. They <laughs> actually have plans. It's funny uh, that Eva Marie pretty much walks around like. Like a, like a stripper, like who just started. Like her outfit. Who just started? Okay. Yeah, she hasn't taken the clothes off. She's taken like the first layer off. So you're getting the taste of what you're gonna see. But you still have to throw some more ones down to see Basic, the rest. Basically, she hasn't learned the trick of having three or four fake names deep, where it's like, yeah, my stage name is Chastity, but it's really Tiffany, and Tiffany's really no, I mean, not like, a real name either. Out, she comes out with like a, a shirt, and then she takes the shirt off, and then you see like. You see she's wearing, like, she has a, a wedgie. You can see, like, almost her whole ass and blah, blah, blah. She's not dressed to actually bump. She's dressed to, you know, fill the seats with teenagers. Um, all right, so... Anyways. Basically, if you're on SmackDown and you're in the women's division, like, ask for your release. It's it's a horrible place to be. They don't even have a belt right now. There's no storylines or real angles. Like, the first week of SmackDown, they all just come out to the ring and whine and moan, and it's like... That was horrible. Hey, that was awful. You just paraded out a whole division that has no meaning. Like, it, they actually brought light to the fact. And I felt bad, too. Like, when they did that big Royal, uh, the, the Royal Rumble or the whatever, Battle Royal at the beginning, 
I was like, oh, the women are going to get in this. They're like, every superstar is going to have a chance. And then all the women file off, and it's just the men left in the ring. And I was just like, oh, I forgot. I'm not watching Lucha Underground here. Boo. They're not superstars. They're divas. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. And they're, and that's what it is. On SmackDown, they're still being treated like divas. On mm-hmm. Raw, they're treating it like a real women's division. On well, Smack- And in NXT, they're treating it like a real women's division. But here you are. If you're a woman in the WWE and you're on SmackDown, Get your butt off that show as fast as you can. Unless you're Eva Marie, stay there. <laughs> yes, I agree. Nah. With you. Um, just, you have you have like Alexa Bliss, who's awesome, but she never made it to the like to the A level. You have Carmella, who never made it past C level, and she became competent, but she wasn't. She still wasn't all that great. Them, and, her not being with Enzo and Cass is fucking bullshit. Yeah, they, she needs to go back with them. But, I mean, she also still needs to kind of earn her own way a little bit more. And then Enzo can't try and, like, hit on Sasha. Oh, whatever. That segment was amazing. I, I loved Enzo hitting on Sasha. I liked it. I thought it was Did, perfect. Didn't he almost fall on his head by running to the ropes while he was going? <laughs> Plus, it sucks because Big Cass and Carmella are, are you know, boning in real life. Oh, so really? Like, they're split up. Oh, they don't get to be on the road together? Mm-hmm. Like, boo. No road boning. Um, so, okay, here's, here's my big question for you, Byron. Yes. The new universal belt. Yes. I'm not going to ask you if you think Finn will go over or not. I'm going to ask you if you think the belt itself would benefit from having a new era, new guy be the first champion. Is that story big enough to propel the belt itself into the future? Is that the way to go? I, that's an interesting question. I think it's a great situation as a fan uh, because I'm not so much invested for one specific guy to win, but I want to see the match, and I really want one person to go over. I, I don't want them to, you know, schmoz it up. Um, I, I mean, personally, I think that Seth should win, and he, because he can anchor the show. I, I agree with that, and I think that it gets on him pretty quickly. But honestly, I think you hot shot it on to Finn. I think honestly, I think you put the belt on Finn. You you give yourself that big first, like that first time they put the belt on Rocky Maivia, where it was like, I don't know if we should do this, but let's just get put it on him. He'll be the youngest champion. We'll make a big deal out of it, and then we can turn him into something after that. I will say this: if if, if Finn comes out in the as the demon, he's winning. Okay, that would be interesting. There's no way he's going to lose the first time he's on WWE TV as the Demon. (laughs) You have so much faith in WWE. (laughs) Jesus Christ. He's going to job as the Demon, and then he's going to job in in a way that makes him look like an idiot. He's going to job to that front-falling DDT. He's gonna drop. He's gonna fucking job to the super kick setup, or the turnbuckle power bomb. Sting job to the turnbuckle power bomb. No shame in that. Oh, I don't know. I dude. I just think I just think that this is a chance for WWE to really do something. They feel like they're in that mode right now. I think fe- I think we all know two or three months from now they're probably gonna go back. I feel fortunate, though, because it's like Lucha Underground's off for a very brief amount of time, and it just so happens to be that that's when WWE has actually gotten a lot better for the first time in, like, three years. So, and who, um, know, who knows and if only, what they're doing? Because Roman was penciled in there and probably was penciled to go over. Yeah, I like it. Uh, let's. I really do hope that Finn goes over, not because I am some huge... I gotta see Finn Balor win, Mark. I think it's just the best thing for the overall product and for wrestling as a whole. And again, I don't think they need to leave it on him for a long time. I think they just need that monumentous moment right now that the fans are actually behind. Um, you know, and even if they they take the belt off of Sasha to kind of even the playing field to do it at the same time, I I would. I don't. I'm gonna tell you guys something. You're both fucking crazy. First of all. Uh, Nothing second, the other title match is face versus face. They are not going to have two face champions. Seth is keeping the belt. 
He doesn't have it. How's he keeping it? Well, whatever. It? Same fucking thing. Well, I mean, he's look, the he doesn't, but he is the champion at heart. I, I like. I feel like he's already the champion walking into this, and, and it's his to defend, especially because he's just coming out of the title picture, whereas Finn was not in that title picture. Finn was a former uh, NXT champ. Yeah, but not in the WWE championship title picture that Seth mm-hmm. just got. But you know what Finn has that that uh, Seth Rollins does not the Bullet Club. Yeah. Yeah. Stop fantasy fantasy booking that. It's not going to happen. Why would the Bullet Club help a face be the heel when they're heels? No. That'll, That'll happen down the road. That'll happen. That will happen. It's just not as soon as Byron thinks it will. That'll be like at it's WrestleMania. Fun. That's a way for that's a way for Finn to go over without really hurting Seth. Yeah, you do that turn at at Royal Rumble or Mania next year. You don't do that this soon. Anyway, um, the last thing I'll talk about, because it's going to lead into everything else we're talking about, is Brock Lesnar is back on WWE TV. Um, he came out and cut a 20-minute promo. Oh, wait, no, he didn't. Heyman cut the promo. <laughs> Brock just stood there and grunted, which was awesome. Uh, Orton comes in, hits the RKO, which was out of nowhere. I will say this. I ignored all of what Heyman was saying because I just wanted to listen for steroid chants. And then uh, the RKO out of nowhere was obviously going to happen. However, what was surprising was how animated and how much of a human being Randy Orton looked like afterwards. Yeah, that was different. That was strange, and I kind of liked it. And I guess that's the only way you can play against Brock, isn't it? I don't. I think he's just happier. He had some time off. Now he's back to work. I want him to stop. I want him to do the boss root and split kick again. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Cross gets to do that because he's a legit shooter. Randy Orton does not get to fucking do that because he's not legit anything. He's a legit punk ass bitch, is what Randy Orton is. <laughs> he's, the, he's the legit viper. Um. No, you could tell, though, that, that Randy had definitely changed because he ran out through the crowd and he wasn't, like, shooing people off of him and telling them to, to screw off. I mean, and it wasn't just because yeah. of his face thing. He actually managed to go out amongst the people and not be a dick. So You know why? <laughs> it's because he realized if he switches to a part-timer, it doesn't matter if he violates wellness anymore. Yeah, he's looking a little healthy, if you know what I mean. Well, yeah, so he should be. He's up against Brock, and we know how healthy he is. Remember how Randy Orton was making a big deal about wanting to take a degree schedule recently? Mm. I love that. For people who don't know what we're referring to, the WWE said that Brock's whole UFC uh, steroid or whatever, I'm sorry, PED enhancement uh, thing did not matter in the WWE because he's only a part-timer, so it didn't fall under the wellness policy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So basically what we're saying is, as long as you're not on TV full-time, you can just be doing rails and steroids in the back and come out all jacked up and beat up our talent mm-hmm. on pay-per-views. And yeah, they, they went out of their way to say full-time performer. Full-time performer. So Triple H can still be roided out of his fucking mind. He's on a contract. He's on a full... First of all, he probably is. But he's on. he is on a full-time performer contract. But guess who isn't? Shane McMahon. Guess who's in great shape. Hey, look, Shane's the loud. If Shane is going to come out at WrestleMania every year and fall four stories off of something for me, he can take whatever he wants. I'm fine with that. As long as he doesn't go over the taker, he can take all the steroids he wants. Which, speaking of which, again, I want to remind everyone, the streak never ended because Brock was on the juice. So put a little asterisk next to that one. Here's the thing thing I want to say about this, because this is kind of where I'm going, and this will take me into some MMA talk. The difference between performance-enhancing drugs in MMA and WWE. Now, first of all, I'm not talking about the hardcore anabolic steroids here. The stuff that Brock got popped for is estrogen blockers, which does help you get more jacked. It does have some of the characteristics of steroids, but it's more something maybe there to mask if he was on real steroids, or it's something that some guys use because they feel like they get more nas- natural testosterone production and it's more like a TRT effect. TRT, by the way, not illegal. The estrogen blockers, by the way, not legal. So here's my question and my point about the whole thing. Yes, in MMA, it's an issue. Nothing should be allowed 
for one person. That's not allowed for everyone. There has to be a level playing field because we're talking about a very shoot sport. But in professional wrestling, if these are not things that are illegal to take that you can medically get and they enhance your performance, in wrestling, because of the fact that these guys are actually working together in conjunction, isn't a guy being able to be enhanced and perform better a good thing for the safety of the wrestlers as long as what they're taking is not harming them. See, that's, that's why they have the wellness policy, though. They're afraid of someone dying on their watch like Eddie Guerrero. That's the yeah. whole reason this came out. And that's also... that's a, uh, Dave Meltzer put out a stat that a lot of people um, got upset about, but he brought up how um, back in the dip, before the wellness, when everyone was juicing, the percentage the mortality percentage for wrestlers was worse than the mortality percentage or rate for soldiers in World War II. Now, more people died in a war, but the percentage, like the cut... Right, yeah, the actual... Yeah, I get what you're saying. The, the yeah. breakdown on the pie. Yeah, and, and, you know, that's... A lot of people got upset because they didn't really understand it or there's so, like, you know, they just... But again, those guys were also on the hardcore like Drago, Rocky IV, anabolic steroids. We're not. I'm. We're not yeah. talking about those anymore. I'm talking about things that you or I, as regular dudes, like if I'm a regular dude. I want to go get jacked. I can go get TRT tomorrow. What's what? Which ones are on the counter? <laughs> There's a ton of them. I'm serious. Like, look here. Do this. Go down the USADA list. The first five are legal, and then like the next 380 are legal. There's supplements at GNC that have like regular supplements that say on the ingredients, not this hidden you know, microcosm of shit that's getting people in trouble or whatever. There's regular supplements at GNC that you can go get and take and be jacked that are on USADA's ban list. Now, I don't know what WWE's ban list is like, but I'm just saying performance enhancing when it gives you an advantage to help the guy that you're in the ring wrestling with is a different yeah. story than a performance advantage that the other guy doesn't have when you're actually trying to take his fucking head off. But I there's thing to do. there's a competition aspect in professional wrestling, though. It's not you're not gonna out I mean, punch harder than someone else, but your physique and everything. It's like having someone with CM Punk's body or or looking like the Epicos or whatever the Matadors or. Right. Puerto guys you look like that versus looking like triple h you know the difference could be the, you know do you want to get on some kind of juice and then you look better you look more intimidating if you can move at all like mason ryan looked jacked but he couldn't move and he couldn't handle his look and then he left because he sucked but usually you look better and then people buy your shirt you know and right. then you get the belt and I'm not one to advocate steroid use. I know, I know I'm ripped to the gills, but it's all natural. But uh, it also makes you heal faster from injuries. Just yeah, saying. Yeah, John Cena. Yeah, and I, again, I'm just saying, I don't know if in wrestling, the, the things that, yes, with the mortality rate being high and the way that the old school guys were doing it in the 80s and, and through the 90s, yeah, yeah I, don't sure. really, I don't ever want to see that again. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm advocating. But what I'm saying is there is a lot of stuff that's legal and over-the-counter, and the stuff that Brock got popped for in the UFC, I don't have a problem with him using that in WWE. I have a huge problem with him using it in, in the UFC. I think Mark Hunt's totally right about his whole tirade of, of fucking cheetahs, or whatever Mark Hunt was talking about. But uh, in the WWE, people are making a stink about Brock coming back. He got popped for estrogen blockers, man. I just don't think that that should be something that anyone who's watching WWE should have a problem with. If he's doing something else, yeah. And if the estrogen blockers were there covering something else or because he was coming off of something else, okay, yeah, that's an issue. But innocent until proven guilty. He was not found guilty of that. I don't have a problem with the, the, the estrogen blockers thing. I do, however, think that the WWE's ex his excuse of him not being full time is just malarkey, though. That's just yeah. silliness. I can't even I believe they released that statement. Well, it's <laughs> honestly, didn't they fucking give guys wellness strikes just for being on that ESPN released list or whatever? You know that scandal that happened. Yeah, you so. got it. You got a strike for being in the article. 
Yeah. yeah. And it's like, okay, those guys didn't even test positive, so what the fuck? Well, and, and it's like you should go out and do your own research. Like, their wellness policy is a joke. Like, what, what, like USADA is not a joke. USADA is some real-ass shit, and I think a lot of people are figuring that out the hard way. Um, but, yeah, the wellness policy, it's, it's arbitrary. They can change it to a certain extent. Like, they have you know, certain criteria and stipulations, but pretty much you have to piss somebody off for that to be a factor, I think. Yeah, and they added new rules in that if you come back after, like, say Jeff Hardy came back, he could work off his violations by being clean for so long that the strikes start going away, which really is a rule that was made to benefit Randy Orton, I think. Because yeah. <laughs> he was on his third strike, and I don't think he is anymore, technically. Right. Um, but yeah, but Jeff Hardy would be okay too. But he's clean now anyway, so it's all good. I don't know. They might give him two strikes for the final deletion. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> um, all right, so we have gone into the MMA world here. I might as well keep the transition going. Um, holy crap, Casey, have you been watching some of these fights? We haven't been on, and there's been a couple cards. Oh fuck, man! I was not home. Oh. And the pay per view, I did not get. Well, I'm going to go back further than that to start anyway. i got to talk about Holly Holm versus Valentina Ooh. Shevchenko because I got this one wrong. This is one of the only ones in a long time I've gotten wrong. It wasn't for a title. I haven't gotten any of the title ones wrong, amazingly, because they've been crazy. But exactly what I said Holly Holm was going to do was what Shevchenko did. I thought for sure Greg Jackson and his camp were going to come up with a way for her to just pick her apart with the striking I said on the podcast that Shevchenko is a sharpshooter. She's a, a great striker, one of the best in the world. She's got wins over uh, Joanna and Jacek, um when they fought at a similar weight class in kickboxing and Muay Thai. Three, um, three wins, right? Yeah, several. Said, it's more than I th I've seen two of them, and I think you're right. There might be another one, or maybe that one was an amateur. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so like we knew her her striking was world class. I just thought that that Holly was going to go into this with something else, and boy was I wrong. She just looked like the inferior woman the whole time. It was a great great fight though. Yeah, uh, that was a really fucking entertaining fight from start to finish, and uh, I did see that one. But I think that's the last one. But when you start talking about the cards and refreshing my memory, maybe oh, I'll remember having seen something. Yeah, I'm sure. It, and that was there was a few other fights on that card too. The um, uh, Edson Barbosa pretty much destroyed Gil Melendez, which I kind of saw coming. Um, Edson Barbosa has just been on a tear for a while now, and a lot of people know that. And Gil was out for whatever he shot into his ass because um, he's one of those fucking cheetahs. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe he's just really against like uh, really fast big cats. <laughs> I love that fight though. Edson Barbosa is going to be great. I want to see you know he's definitely working his way up the 155 or um, and then Felice Herrig uh, defeated Kaylin Curran, which was amazing. It was in her hometown. She's she. Fights out of Crystal Lake, Illinois, which is very close to Chicago. She's out at Jeff Kearns. Camp. And it's where fucking Jason's from, dude. She's been <laughs> since her summer camp days. She's been having to dodge fucking hockey mask wearing murderers. Of course, she's gonna kick some ass. And it is kind of like that out there. Crystal Lake, uh, Illinois, is definitely out in the woods. It's like an hour west, I want to say, of Chicago, um, somewhere. I don't know. I just remember driving for way too long in the tap out bus and the the AC wasn't working so good and there's like the three tap out guys and um, we had Patty Mike Curran on with us and like a whole camera crew riding in the bus in the middle of summer in Chicago. Miserable. Um, and before anyone gives me shit, I know the Crystal Lakes and fucking New Jersey in the Friday the 13th films. Don't try to school me on this shit. I fucking know. That's how they got to Manhattan. You're not going to get to Manhattan from fucking Illinois in a boat, okay? Do you really think anybody was going to call you out on that, on this show? Well, maybe. I, except if it was anybody, it would have been me. I'm about to have to call you out on it. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, it was really cool. I love seeing the, the hometown person get the victory. I had her picked in that fight, too. And I think Felice Herrick is good for the sport. And I'm not saying that because she does 
whatever her little hottie stuff is or scantily clad weigh-ins or whatever crap it is that you know people gawk about. I just think that she's she's got a big personality. Um, she puts she's not afraid to put herself out there and sell um, in whatever fashion, whether you agree with it or not. I just think she's good for the sport. She's good for the women's. Hello. Hey, Justin. Uh, I'm back. What happened? Where are you? Where are you, Byron? At all? Can you so... see me, Byron? I can see you, unfortunately. Yeah, I can't see Justin. He's frozen. Okay, there you go, Justin. You're back. Here we are on case you and me, MMA. So anyway, Holly Holm was fighting, but I think she got punched more than she was doing the punching. Do we you... were talking about a completely different fight, Byron. But but he was actually right. That's an improvement. <laughs> Did you actually see one of the fights, Byron? No. Oh. Come on. Even on Twitter, people were like, is Byron going to actually watch the fights if you guys talk about that? Oh, really? <laughs> Yeah, people are asking for you to watch the fights now. You know, it's most awesome. of our listeners are MMA fans, and they say, why Why do you have this fucking guy that probably studies Joe Sando, and, uh, which is beating up your opponent's hand with your nuts? <laughs> See, he won't even get that joke. Why am I even saying it? God damn it. I'm a, I'm a, that was a Joe San early UFC callback there. That's pretty amazing. That's good stuff from Casey. I've heard what happened to him lately, right? I no, I, I saw. I, I've watched UFC one and two. Is is that's a good prison part. because he ta- he uh, they tested DNA evidence of a rape a long time ago and he was connected to it and then now he's in jail. Oh God, I did it not know that. Like years before oh. and then, yeah. Oh, he should get Mayhem Miller as his lawyer. <laughs> that would be awesome. Immediately. Hey, um, hey, Kimbo Slice's uh, son is going to MMA fight now. Yeah, Baby Slice. He's uh, Wait, did he already fight? I don't know. It might, he's might be in the next Bellator, or he was in Bellator that I missed. Sorry. I'll have to find out. But yeah, Baby oh, Slice is supposed to fight be Dada's son, even though he's like six. Oh, God. I don't want anyone in Dada's family anywhere near an octagon without serious medical attention before the fight. Is that like a respirator? Yeah. I still got to say, Dogfight, one of my favorite documentaries. Uh, just what's, your favorite, what's your favorite line from that movie, Casey? What do you keep telling me when you're telling me to watch it? Rest in peace, tree. Is that a spoiler? Yeah, I must think it's spoilers on this show, unless they're Lucha Underground related, that would get us booted from the temple. I was telling one of my friends that that movie has the single most fucked up where are they now segment at the end of it of any documentary I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Including Beyond the Mat, and that one's pretty fucked up. Ooh, yeah. Alright, well, I'll, I'll, I'll have to watch it. You haven't seen it? God. It's secret. <sighs> Casey, tell them your favorite. I'm you movie. down. I don't normally let you down. Normally, I'm the one who has seen everything that you're talking about, Casey. This is one of those rare occasions where I haven't. I will watch it immediately, though. Casey, is I'll watch the movie club of this week. I watched the movie. Yeah, Byron's seen it. Byron, I'm going to talk about UFC 201. Yes. Yeah, I can't wait. I've been waiting all day to do this. I was uh, eating dinner at Red Robin. It was quite delicious. <laughs> all right, so... If you didn't watch it, Tyron Woodley knocked Robbie Lawler the F out. Wow. Ooh. I, actually, I saw a gif of this happening. I, I, I actually predicted this one, too, and a lot of people told me I was crazy. Tyron was a huge underdog going into this fight. I just thought that he was the hungrier fighter. I think, in general right now, hungry fighters are winning. And it's showing that the parity in skill level in the UFC has gotten a lot more level recently. And uh, this is just another example of, like, look, Robbie has been through some wars recently. Getting that belt was such a huge accomplishment. It was not easy for him to hold on to it. Um, I just felt like one of these times, you know, one of these guys was going to come up here. And and I'm not saying that Tyron's a million times better than Robbie by any stretch of the imagination. I think he's just fresher. He hasn't been in there in these wars than Robbie, and he, he had was a little better more. That night, that's all you got to be, really, right? Yeah, I mean, look, that's that's what UFC is. It's the best guy on the night. Yeah. 
in that cage, and Tyron Woodley performed. And by the way, the man's name is Tyron. There's no E on the end of his name. His name, his name is not Tyrone. Dana White keeps calling him Tyrone. Like, <laughs> dear Lord, I know you spoke at the Republican National Convention, but that doesn't overnight make you a racist. I have a Dana like, White question. Is, is, he, is he hot? Is he juicing? Dana White? You think oh, he's hot? Yeah. No. Yeah. No, no. He's fucking huge. <laughs> <laughs> Go back and look at Dana White when he had hair. Like, he had to shave his head just to make the roids look right. It's Come just that's bigger than Barry Bonds. Yeah, dude. No, and, and, and I think Dana's even admitted that he's taken stuff. Like, he had actual prescriptions for all the stuff that he's done or whatever. But, yeah, no, he's juiced. <laughs> he would never pass one of his own USADA tests to get in the ring. But, I mean, and people even questioned that when he was supposedly going to fight uh, Tito Ortiz if, if Dana could, was going to be clean enough. And all of a sudden... <laughs> When that whole rumor was going around, Dana was getting more and more jacked every day, and he that's when he became the same size as Tito Ortiz. I just love that Byron is cackling this loudly at midnight in a hotel room. I love that he's spitting in circles now like it's fear and loathing in Las Vegas. What, is, what are you doing? I'm getting dizzy, and I'm going to throw up and make this segment exciting. They actually gave you a spinning chair in your hotel? I've never been in a hotel that gave me a spinny chair. I guess I have two. Or are you just walking in circles right now? I'm the segment producer. I have a supervising producer. I'm the big boss. You want to see something cool? Check this out. It's called the Ocean. It's true. When I made supervising producer, they gave me a spinny chair. Finally. Where are you going? You ready? He's gonna fall off the fucking balcony and die. And we're catch <laughs> are we making this a is the ocean? A snuff cast here. You see it? Wish you would step down from that ledge, my friend. <laughs> you can't sing Jumper to him. That's not right. Hey, you know what's awesome? Third Eye Blind played a show at the Republican convention, and they they have been, not to you know make a personal political statement, but Third Eye Blind has always been anti-conservative. Like They've all been like pro-human rights and stuff like that. And so for some reason, some idiot booked them, and they were playing, and they just started trolling everyone. Like, why would you book us? And they didn't play. They only played songs that no one knew. They wouldn't play their hits for anyone because they didn't like anyone there. And they would be like, we believe in equality. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then people would boo them. Like, and this was in Cleveland? At the Republican convention. Oh, that's that was, messed up. Oh, why was that in your home? Why don't you brag about that being in your hometown, Mr. Cleveland Rules? <laughs> I, I, I will say this. It was a very smart choice. Uh, Ohio is clearly a swing state, and I know a lot of people that made money from the convention coming there and are very enamored with the Republican Party right now because of it. Uh, well, how about this? How about Donald Trump asking three times in the past week why we can't use nuclear weapons to fuck people up? <laughs> I, I can't even go there. Don't you ask yourself that every time you wake up in the morning? Because I know um, I fucking do. Yeah, but we're not president, you know. Look, I'm, look, I'm just gonna say this: Casey obviously advocates the use of nuclear weapons on multiple countries because then hopefully we'll get more kaiju movies from different countries. Like we'll get Chechenian kaiju movies all of a sudden. It'll be great. You know, there was a Korean kaiju movie, and it was because Kim Jong Il actually kidnapped a filmmaker and made him make his own movie. His own kaiju movie, because he fucking loved Godzilla and shit, but he wanted a Korean one. This is true. There's a book about it that I haven't read, but it still is true, and I need to read the fucking book. This is insanity. Okay, so Rose Nama Yunus uh, versus Carolina Kowalkiewicz. Kowalczyk? You got it. Nama Jumunis versus Kowalkiewicz. I can't say the names of the women in this fight, but Thug Rose versus Special K was a really awesome fight. Could you say those names, Casey? Special K from fucking Ring of Honor? No, Car Carolina Ko Kowalkiewicz. Kowalczyk. Hey, no, it's it's Kowalkiewicz, isn't it? Or is it Kowalczyk? Oh, I don't fucking know. I, I, was, I was literally at Red Robin eating some fucking pretzels with cheese hey, and a burger. Well, I have to say, I got this fight wrong. What were you saying, Brian? I just want to know how much Casey's getting for name-dropping Red Robin. Is that an official MMM sponsor now? 
Dude, it's so awesome. They moved it outside of the mall into its own freestanding restaurant, and it, it made the food more delicious somehow is all I know. I love their sliders. The answer to that question is another commercial? <laughs> yes. So the answer to the question is yes. We just haven't given you a taste of that money yet, Byron. I need. I, 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 I got to say, I recommend their S'mores Campfire Milkshake. Fucking amazing. I'm vegetarian. I can't eat a Red Robin anymore. Oh, you're missing out. The barbecue bacon sliders are the whip. Dude, a fucking a fucking s'mores milkshakes. Marshmallows aren't made out of meat, bro. It's all right. Don't tell them that. I've been telling them they're made out of meat for years. I I cut out dairy too. Oh Jesus! Wow. That's why I'm in such I'm 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 leaning up right now. I'm in such good shape. Anyway, yeah, so let me tell you about this up. fight. I'm gonna tell you about this fight. Yeah. Thug Rose, Special K. Um, I picked Thug Rose. I thought she was on her way to a championship fight. Special K, Carolina derailed that in a great fight. This is probably one of the best women's fights, and I don't think either of their stock went down. Um, and I think Carolina may sadly find herself going up against uh, Joanna Champion soon, which is probably not going to be a very good night for her because I think Joanna Champion will put it on her face parts, and it'll once again be a match of two women whose names I can't say fighting each other to the death for my entertainment, and I will watch it and enjoy it. I will see any Johanna fight because she fucks people up and it's awesome. Yeah. Well, I mean, this fight was two women on equally almost that same level just battling the whole time. I mean, Thug Rose won the first round um, and Carolina probably won the second and third round. The second round had back and forth moments. The third round had back and forth moments. It was just a really great fight. Um, here's one for you. That this is going to make you going to want to watch the card now, Casey, if you haven't seen it. Um, Matt Brown versus Jake Ellenberger. Believe Ooh. it or not, Jake Ellenberger, who was pretty much out of the UFC and mm -hmm. begged to be back in and have this fight, uh, beat the brakes off of Matt Brown, the meanest man on the fucking planet. Holy shit. Yeah, and like liver kicks and punches and put him down like minute 46. It was amazing. I love, I love a good kick to the lever. Oh. <laughs> lever, lever kick. I got to say, Byron, since you've stopped eating meat, you look like you did with makeup in the short film to make you look more pale and fucked up. Oh, really? You need some bacon, bro. I had you bacon a few days ago. I'm not 100% vegetarian. Okay, that's You need more, more bacon and less porn. That will help your, your complexion. The Wi-Fi in this hotel isn't that good. Um, I don't know. You look pretty clear to us. Yeah, you look fine to me. Other matches of interest. Uh, oh, Nikita Krylov with a walk-off uh, knockout. Oh, the fucking Russian Nightmare? Yeah. Who, that, that, that would be a great wrestling name. The Russian Nightmare Nikita Krylov. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> over Ed Herman, who's solid. And then this, I can't believe you guys missed, a luchador. A luchador in UFC, guys. Oh wow! Oh, I've I've seen this so-called luchador. Oh, um, well, look, he's wearing a, a fairly standard, like generic Mexico lucha mask. Um, it's his name is Eric Perez, but they let him wear it to the ring. He cut his promo after the fight in the mask, which was good. amazing. Um, and he won. He beat uh, Francisco Rivera. It's a good fight. I gotta say, it's been done by people who were actual luchadors first, and they didn't all suck like Alberto. Yeah. And uh, I also have to say that Kazushi Sakuraba regularly wore machines masks to the ring, and I just I just love Sakuraba. I just had to throw it out there. I was I was thinking about him today. How great that man was. Well, uh, yes, you should be thinking about that at least once a week. Why not? You still, uh, you've been watching New Japan, Byron. Do they th still throw Sakuraba out there every once in a while? Uh, I don't know what Sakurapa is, and I'm still trying to figure out what's actually going on when I watch. Holy shit, Justin's making the face of that guy that saw The Undertaker <laughs> lose. <laughs> Stealing gimmicks. Stealing gimmicks. <laughs> um, all right, well, so here's what I'm going to close with today. I think you guys, uh, Casey, you, you're, you're up on this one. We got some new rules in MMA. Yeah, and some of them are fucking cool, man, I think. <laughs> I, I'm gonna the the thing I like. Oh, first of all, the ABC, which is the Association of Boxing Commissions. This is like the whole association of all the boxing commissions. Um, MMA has their own kind of team that has been put together 
of like Randy Couture and Matt Hughes and like one of the old commentators from Bellator and you know like Big John or somebody like there's a bunch of like people who know MMA stuff who've been working on these rules for the ABC um, and pitching it to the ABC so it's the first thing not to think is that it's a bunch of old fuddy duddy boxing guys coming up with these rules. It's not. actually the first thing I thought it was that it was another bad creation. <laughs> ABC, BBD, the East, East Coast, Coast family. Um, so the new rules passed, and they passed by 42 to one with two abstentions. Um, and there are certain states that are not a part of the commission at all, and I believe actually Ohio is one of them. Um, so when people go there and do MMA, they have to just decide what rules each time. But they usually use something close to the unified rules, I'm thinking. Um, so anyway, basically, there's a new 10-8 rule that I love. Yes. We're going to see more 10-8s, and it makes sense. They gave actual criteria. Um, if you have two of the three things, it should be in consideration for... Uh, it should be in consideration for a 10-8 round. And if you have all three, it should definitely be a 10-8 round. So it's like dominance, uh, I don't know, control, a bunch of stuff. Um, dominance, control, and impact. Right. And, yeah. and, the, and the impact one, there was some issues with the wording initially because the initial wording was damage. And they didn't like the thought that they were promoting damaging somebody as a way to... Um, Byron, I'm changing your levels. Why are your levels so high? I don't know. I'm not even talking right now. <laughs> I know. Um, I like the 10-8 thing. People have been talking about the scoring being jacked in MMA for a long time. I don't know if the judges are going to be able to comprehend this new rule the right way, but the spirit of making the rule is amazing. What did you think about that part, Case? Well, I think that if you're at more risk of getting a 10-8 fucking rounds, that maybe it'll get some of the guys that are a little more apprehensive in the octagon to be a little more active, uh, and that it may lead to better fights, but first we're going to have to see judges do a lot more 10-8 rulings. Because I know we were having this discussion with J-Man, because he yeah. thinks there should be a lot more 10-8s already. A and, lot of people do. A lot of people think yeah. that that is the solution to the jacked-up... Uh, judging. Um, and it might be. The one weird thing about it is it throws in this even number thing, so mm. you could start leading to more draws because of it. So, because if you get a whole bunch of, you know, 10 9, 9 10 rounds, and then 10 8, you know, or you get two 10 9s and then the one 10 8, the other way, all mm. of a sudden, then you could end up with a lot more draws. It's kind of fucked up. Yeah, I didn't think of it that way because I'm horrible at math. Yeah, so, you know, I doubt you'll see it in the five-round fights, but you never know. I mean, that 10-8 round could be the weird equalizer, and that could cause some some nasty finishes that nobody wants to see, some, some oh, my God, nobody wants. Um, but they also clarified a bit the octagon control thing, um, not taking away that it's a factor in scoring a fight, but now kind of specifying when you go to these things. Like, first you count punches and strikes and impact, and then you deal with uh, ring dominance or octagon dominance in certain situations, um, which I agree with, because basically what they're trying to negate is the pushing forward does not create ring dominance. Uh -oh. Just walking after a guy the whole fight, if it's a boring fight and no one's doing anything, is not going to win you the fight anymore. Um, you're going to look at everything else before you get to that. So that is not octagon generalship or, or dominance anymore. Um, I feel like GSP is going to have to change his game plan a little bit. Just you know, talk a little shit there. Yeah. Some of his fights, I, I don't know. No, no, there's and there's a few guys. I mean, and that's what they're really going after. I mean, you've got basically you've got a guy like Randy Couture and Matt Hughes. And Matt Hughes, he's written some guys out himself, and he'll be honest about it, and I've talked to him about it. He'll tell you himself that, like, he fought to win, and there was a lot of times where he took the cheap route of laying on somebody or something like, hey, if they say that's a way to win the fight, I'll do that. I don't care. I don't get beat up. I can sit on a guy that's not as strong as me or doesn't have as good wrestling. I'll sit on him. You know, Hughes is one of the most honest, straightforward guys about it, and but he'll also tell you those are the most boring fights he's been in, and he's not necessarily proud of them. 
Um, but so you got guys like Randy Couture and him who are, are basically telling you the way that you can beat these dudes up and make it more exciting and safer to a certain extent. Now, the state of New Jersey was the one in the 42 to 1. And they said some nasty things about fighters, and Randy Couture took issue with it. Um, and I don't blame him. They basically were disparaging to the fighters in saying that the new rules about what is a knockdown uh, or what is a gro uh, grounded opponent are different. Um, and, and they were taking issue with that fact because they feel, state of New Jersey feels like the the new rule is basically that you have to have both hands down or clearly be down. The touching one hand to the ground is no longer um, a credible way of saying that you're a downed opponent. Uh -huh. What the rule is searching to do, and this is what Randy basically told them with big middle fingers, is like, no dummies. What we want is we don't want gray area. People are going to get hurt a lot more when there's gray area. When you got some guy who's on his legs and he keeps touching his hand down and picking it up and touching it and picking it up, that's when he's going to get kicked in the face or kneed in the face real hard in an unfortunate situation. You take that out yeah. of the equation where you either have to have your hands down or you have to be standing up for real, and what's going to happen is guys are going to get the fuck down. Or they're going to get the fuck up. They're not going to hover. If they're up, it. they're going to defend themselves the whole fucking time, and they're not going to get an unanswered knee to the face. Right. So what uh, New Jersey was saying, and what they think is the problem, is that if a guy do goes into that three-point stance, now that head kicks are legal. And so they were interpreting, and they're the only ones that interpreted this rule that basically if you're doing this, it could create more head trauma. And they started citing the, the NFL and the other sports and all these head trauma reports and this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, you're, you're talking to Randy Couture. This is not a guy that wants to see more fighters get hit in the head. Matt Hughes is not a fighter that wants to see more guys get hit in the head. Nobody on this commission that came up with these rules is a person that wants to see fighters get hit in the head more. No, this is isn't them trying to turn it into pride. Yeah, it's like we, we we have gotten to the point where we've done away with a bunch of those rules, but maybe we created too many rules that are making the, the outcomes of fights wrong. The trick is to get more fighter safety and better rules in there. And I just found the whole thing um, very interesting that, that Randy had to give this rebuttal to the state of New Jersey about you know what they thought the deal was with, with the whole grounded opponent thing. I think it's a great rule. I think that you know clearing up what the, the gray area is is exactly the way that you fix some of these problems. All of these problems in MMA, scoring, punishment, um, it's a big deal. Um, and then the gray areas are what cause the problems. That's what makes fans hate the outcomes of some of these fights. I like the um, the fuck you John Jones rule that they did uh, with the eye poking. So he can't okay. come with people like this anymore when he's fighting. They just outlawed eye poking? Well, no, so here's the deal. A lot of guys do what's called pawing. Well, yeah. they're, I messed up the color temperature of my camera with my pale hand. Um, not a white card. So <laughs> you do this and you, you kind of gauge your distance and it's Almost like a jab, but you have no intention of actually hitting the guy. But if you're John Jones, you go you like this. Him back, like, and John, you... John's doing it with his fingers out here. And he's like sticking them right into people's eyes a lot. And a lot of other guys are doing that. And they're catching fingernails and whatnot. Or you're po poking people in the eye. Um, very common. Huge problem. There was a few cards um, last year. There was like three cards in a row with eye pokes. And one of those cards had like two eye pokes from this very thing happening. Um... Now, you can still do it, but your hand, according to the new rule, has to be at a flat 90-degree angle. If you are seen to come in at all, it will be considered a foul if you come, you know, fingertips first. So if you paw at a guy like this and you hit him flat or you're, you're just gauging yourself, because they can't tell you you have to keep your hands closed. It's an open-hand grappling sport to a certain extent. So 
you know, who's to say that your goal is not to do that and then grab a guy's wrist or to shoot a takedown or whatever. So you right. don't have to have your fist closed the whole time. But hopefully this will clear up a lot of problems because it is now flat out illegal to do that move that John Jones has done a lot. And, and he's not the only one. I mean, a ton of guys do that, especially a lot of grapplers who are setting up grappling moves or judo throws, uh, want to get in close. You know, um, that's a great rule. It's a great rule. It's amazing that they couldn't have come up with something that simple and that easy sooner. You know, instead of a warning. And and, and the, my hope for these things too is that just take the point. Like, why are we messing around anymore? Like, you start grabbing the cage, don't knock the guy's hand off. Take a point immediately. Like, they, these guys all know these rules now. They've been warned in the back. They've been, you know, like, some of the ones that are blatant, you're going down, somebody's got you in a takedown, you reach up and try to grab the cage, yes, ref should go over, slap his hand off, and then the ref should stop everything and walk around and take that point right there. You cheat oh, What if you lose a point and then you get a 10-8? Then it's a fucking 10-7. Yeah. <laughs> this is how you change the sport. This is how you get concrete decisions, and this is how you get people to adhere to the rules. Admonishment has never been a way to keep people from doing stuff. If you got a warning or knew you were going to get a warning the first time, every time you were speeding, and you had to get caught speeding twice in a day to get the actual ticket, would you ever not speed? Yeah. <laughs> never. I never. wouldn't because I'm a law-abiding citizen. But um... <laughs> Hey, Chael Sonnen was the one that said it best. Like, dude, if you're not trying to cheat to win, if you're not trying to push the rules to the very edge every single time you're in there, then yeah. you are not taking advantage of everything that, <laughs> that you're being provided with, every opportunity that you have to win a fight. Or like as if, said even better by Eddie Guerrero, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. Yeah, I mean, that's no. it. That's the whole thing. Like, you know, if they're going to let me get away with grabbing the cage and not getting taken down, I'm going to do it. If they're going to let me get away with poking at a guy's face, not trying to even put his eye out, but making him worried that maybe I will, why wouldn't I do that? Right. Hey, if I'm Czech Congo, I'm going to kick the guy in the dick a few times, you know? Yeah, I mean, like, let's just... Look, and, and, and there are exceptions, obviously. Look, low blows, there's times when you're setting up for an inside leg kick, the guy turns into it, and he steps a direction that you couldn't have possibly anticipated. Not every low blow is intentional cheating. Grabbing a cage every time is intentionally cheating. Yeah. Beating with your fingers, poking at somebody's face, is intentionally cheating. <laughs> and now the rules say it, you know? They should switch it to where everyone has to poke each other in the eye. Well, hey, let's level the playing field. Everyone go in there with half an eyeball. I mean, dude, ask Mike Winklejohn. He caught one by accident just in training, and he's, you know, the guy who holds the mitts. He caught one, and he can't see right out of one of his eyes. He's one of the best trainers in the world now, but it sucks. I mean, the guy's got a jacked up eye. It's Fucking serious. Bisping, dude. Yeah, look at Bisping. He used to be a handsome guy. He is troll ugly now and a champion. He's got a belt. That belt makes you a lot more pretty. It sparkles. That's it. That's all I got to talk about. You guys got anything else you want to talk about? Um, Byron's hair looks dumb. I'm tired. Casey's face looks like he's stupid. You're on East Coast time. It's like midnight there, isn't it? Yeah. It's cool 30. I have to go take some video pictures of it. Since we started, the sun has... Oh, that's a reflection. But the sun has set in, uh, mm -hmm. in L.A. Yeah, and, and in the boonies as well. <laughs> well, that's kind of part of L.A. Not really. Oh. Really? Like, You're like in... You're like Kentucky to Cincinnati, to my Cincinnati, I think. I don't know what any of this Oh, uh, yeah, we do have hillbillies. Yeah. Oh, Castaic? <laughs> <laughs> it's a giant truck stop. That's all Castaic is. Dude, a guy just got shot by cops here, like, a block away from my house. What on? Oh, dude. Oh, can, we guess, can we guess what color he was, or, or are we not doing that? Oh, go ahead and oh, guess. Wow. Oh, man, I hope this is not some Ferguson kind of thing. No, no, he was a white dude, but... Um, yeah, Kistake, so. there's only white people in Kistake. He was a homeless guy. He was riding a bicycle, and then they stopped him, and he got off the bike, and some people say he ran, some people he didn't, and this is where the story's getting really fucked up in the press right now, and they shot the dude and killed him, and this is a guy that... I've seen him around town, definitely. Okay. Like, he's been living in Castaic for a while. Um, sorry guys um, well 
that's it. That's all I have to talk for talk about this week. This was pretty interesting doing it this way. This was the first full run of this, so let us know what you guys think. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at MMMshow75. You can email us, MMMshow75 at gmail.com. Um, you can leave comments here on the YouTube thing. You, If you're listening to this later, uh, go check out the video. Just see what you think of it. Because um, I know a lot more people will probably still at this point hear the regular podcast version of this. But we hope you guys enjoyed it. What did you guys think of doing it this way? Easier, fun? Oh, dude, I think it was awesome, but man, the people listening are not going to get any of that iPo conversation where we're pantomiming shit into the camera the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's, and I guess that's one of the drawbacks of being able to see myself is I can do this and yeah. feel like I'm getting my point across. And that's true. I no really, one at home knows what this is if you're listening to the podcast. Yeah, he's basically <laughs> hailing Hitler right now. Uh, <laughs> it's true. The noted the the house you know, the in-house anti-Semite is is bringing up a new UFC role so he can how Hitler. Yeah, that's me. Wait, no, it's not. <laughs> We're only um, anti-Semitic when it comes towards you, Byron, and that's all we have. No, that's not that that has nothing to do with with anti-Semitism. That's anti-Byronism. I'm it's only half Jewish. Oh, can we do. make that a thing? Like, and put that on the shirts? Anti-Byronism? Oh, it's done deal. It's coming. Oh, I gotta talk to Charlie too about our logo. My man uh, Charlie DeMarco, big shout out to him. Uh, there's no way in hell he's still listening to the podcast this late, or unless he fast forwarded right to the MMA part. But if you are listening, Charlie, big shout out for uh, yep. coming up with the new MMM show logo. It's almost finished. We're gonna do a couple more tweaks, and uh, I don't know what we're gonna do with it. Maybe we'll put it on a T-shirt. Maybe we'll just put it on the internet. Maybe we'll uh, dance a jig on it. Maybe we'll make a giant ring mat out of it. Maybe hey, we'll let's make start a a, oh, like when Tank Abbott was with three count in WCW and had his little spot that he would dance on. Yeah, who knows? We'll do something with it. We're, like, you know, we're doing a Kickstarter, MMM show Kickstarter, to raise funds to pay for the logo to get tattooed on Casey's. Oh, yeah. if it if it comes out really dope, I'll get the tat. I'll get a tat. I don't care. Even if we never do the show again, I'll get the tat. I'm not getting a tattoo, but can we do a Kickstarter to get Tank Abbott to be a co-host on the show? Because I fucking love that guy. That would be awesome. And if you're listening and you want to be a guest on the show, uh, hit us up. We might let you on. If you have a crazy fan theory, or if you're a wrestler or a luchador, or if you're, or if you're a fighter, fucking Tank Abbott, yeah. Let us know if you have any interest <laughs> in being on the show. With this new Google Hangouts thing, I think... Uh, It'll be easy to have some people on. Like I said, we're working on a few things. We're going to get off this thing and go talk about like what we're going to do with the Lucha Draft and some Lucha Awards, but hopefully uh, we have some fun stuff for you guys. And the next season of Lucha Underground is just around the corner. Some big fights just around the corner. Conor McGregor and Nate Diaz will start previewing that next week. And then we also have the big steep Amy Jocic, uh, Alistair Overeem fight coming up. When CM Punk, Mickey Gall, all sorts of great stuff coming up. Um, so until next time, stay calm and stay in the mix.